Yeah, it's it's uh, still it's uh, setting up done. Okay, so you take the you do. And we are live. Excellent. Started streaming less than a minute ago. Okay. We still are, we have like 50 attendees or 45. Let's wait a bit until it fills up. I'll wait till there. It's 12.04 over here. It starts at 12, just after 12.05. Oh yeah, I will send the slides. Mm. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I posted this. I sent the slides to to, to Ramon. So you guys yeah. should be. I should have I'll access that. to the slides yeah. uh, later today. All right. So we have at this point sixty three uh, attendees. So let me begin. Good afternoon again. And uh, welcome to my talk, which is a very high level introduction to neural networks. We'll go, go over a little bit of their history, what they represent and what they learn. If you're looking for uh, algorithms on how they will learn, then that is not going to be covered because that's part of a different, uh, different part of the workshop. Now, as things happen, my machine likes to freeze, and so my uh, I have a little spinning wheel on my PowerPoint. Ah, it's been stop spinning. So let me begin. So here's what we're going to learn. Uh, what is a neural network? Some historical perspective, what it can model, and what do they actually learn? So I'm Diksha Raj. I'm a professor in the Language Technologies Institute at Carnegie Mellon. That picture to the right is my university most of it anyway. I also have uh, affiliate positions in the machine learning, uh, electrical and computer engineering and music tech departments. So my email is bigsha at cs.cmu.edu. I should change this because uh, if you if anyone sends email to bigsha at cs.cmu.edu with the new upgrade of uh, the uh, systems at CMU, the odds are that the mail will either keep getting bounced around or end up in spam. So just send email to bigsha at cmu.edu and drop the CS. So let's begin. What is a neural network? Now, you're here for a machine learning workshop. So all of you know that neural networks are the in thing in machine learning these days. Uh, they, are, they have established the state of the art in a great many pattern recognition, prediction, and analysis problems, uh, often exceeding any previous benchmark obtained even five years ago by very large margins. Anytime you have a sufficient amount of data, neural networks will provide you performance, which sometimes even beats human performance on these tasks. So here are some examples of the kind of breakthroughs neural networks have achieved. Now, all of the breakthroughs I'm showing you are from the time where this new revolution actually began. Although we've been working on neural networks for a long time, it was in 2016 that they finally suddenly began giving us the kind of performance that we take for granted these days. So for example, prior, we've been working on automatic speech recognition systems for the better part of 70 years now. And, uh, in 2016 uh, or 2015, if you tried to use Siri, the responses you usually got were funny more than useful. But then suddenly in 2016, this happened. Microsoft AI beats humans at speech recognition on a very challenging, uh, on a task that used to previously be considered challenging, which was switchboard. The Microsoft automatic speech recognition system began performing recognition better than humans could. And since then, the performance has only gotten exponentially better. And so 
this was a, uh, a staging point for a huge revolution in speech recognition. Same thing with machine translation. In 2015, if you translate, used Google Translate, which was the best translation system of the time, at least the best translation system available to the masses, if you used it to translate English to Spanish and translated the resulting Spanish back to English, what went in and what came out would not be related at all. This was in 2015. And suddenly in 2016, uh, the situation changed. We began getting translation performance that was not merely good. It was in many cases comparable or better than what humans could do. In fact, these days, even expert translators will first put their text into Google Translate, use it, what comes out as a template, and then work on it for most languages. That's how good it has become. And that's because, once again, as in the case of speech recognition, in 2016, the world switched from using older models to neural network-based systems for machine translation or image segmentation and classification. Now, I can't, uh, this is a stock photograph, so I can't uh, vouch for the veracity of this figure, but the kind of performance shown here for image segmentation and classification is readily available with, uh, uh, the, with the latest neural networks. In fact, you yourself can train a YOLO model, which does something this good. So here, for example, it has identified various objects. It says, this is a building, this is a person, He's, this person's carrying a bag, here's another human, this is a push cart, uh, there's a bicycle, there's a bag. You can see the various kinds of things that uh, the uh, system has not only detected, it has also classified. And this is a very complex task. If you look at it, look at the picture, and yet the network can do it. And this performance is powered by neural networks or in the case of games. Now, for the longest time, the kind of pinnacle of AI was being, was considered playing intelligence-based games like chess or Go. And of course, in the 90s, we had already managed to build AI systems that could beat the best humans at chess. And in fact, the first system to beat a human grandmaster was someone's PhD thesis at CMU. And this person went to IBM to construct Deep Blue, which went on to beat Gary Kasparov. Anyway, uh, so Go was, chess was fine, but uh, Go was considered way, way tougher. A uh, chess game has a total of something like 10 raised to 120 possible states. Go has 10 raised to 180. So it's much more challenging. And it was generally assumed that, you know, a machine is unlikely to be beating a human anytime soon. And then in 2016, you had this neural network powered game uh, system that beat the world champion. And these days you have neural networks that can begin to learn to play the game. And in a few hours can beat any system, any human, any game ever built before. That's how good they've become. Or uh, here's another example also from 2016. Uh, or maybe 15, where you have a bunch of pictures and they have been automatically captioned by an, a machine. So man in black hat is playing guitar. Construction worker in orange safety vest is working on a road. Two young girls are playing with Lego toy. Well, this is probably not a young girl, but it gets the concept right. This is particularly interesting. Boy doing backflip on the wakeboard. So you can see uh, that it gets it right. And you would be excused for imagining that a human being had written these captions. And this was five years ago. The system, these systems are much, much better now. And this again was possible because we began using neural networks to, or, and successfully designing neural networks to do these jobs. And a lot more, image analysis, natural language processing, speech processing, uh, even predicting stocks, all of your hedge funds these days do their prediction based on neural networks. In every one of these cases, the, the state of the art is being achieved using neural networks. So these are obviously very, very, very powerful systems. And then it's something that you must learn about. And then here's the ultimate argument on why you should learn about neural networks. 
It used to be that even just five or six years ago, if you were really good at neural networks, this was a brownie point on your resume. These days, if you don't know about neural networks, you might as well not waste time going on the job market. Nobody wants you. So uh, this is, it's almost become mandatory to learn all about neural networks. So you have all of these networks, these, these neural network based systems doing amazing things like transcribing voice, captioning images, playing games. So what are these systems? In each case, you have this box, which is a neural network, which takes in some input like that voice signal and produces some output like its transcription or a game state and it takes in a game state and predicts the next game state or it takes in an image and generates the caption. So what is this box? What's inside these, these magical boxes which perform these very complex tasks? So to understand that, maybe we should begin by going to the uh, root of the problem. Now, all of these tasks that we spoke about just now, transcri transcribing speech, recognizing speech, captioning images, playing games, these are fundamentally human tasks powered by the human brain. So maybe to understand how one could do this automatically, you begin by looking at the human brain or even before that, the process of human cognition. We are able to do all of these amazing things because we have the ability of cognition. We can learn, we can solve problems, we can recognize patterns, we can create. We can just sit in one one place and cogitate. So this is what cognition allows us to do. And we really want our systems to be able to do something like this. We want this is the this is the capability that we want our systems to emulate. But then, how do humans actually uh, perform this amazing task of cognition? The problem is that if our brain was simple enough for us to understand it, we would be too simple to understand the brain. So uh, the, uh, this is you know, a direct quote from Marvin Minsky. This is extremely complicated. Cognition is uh, possibly never ever going to be fully understood, but that doesn't mean we don't try. So people have been worrying about you know, how does cognition work? How do humans operate? for thousands of years. In fact, the earliest models for human cognition go back to at least 400 BC by Plato, where Plato's model was one of associationism. He, Plato claimed or Plato hypothesized that well, maybe it wasn't Plato, maybe he was just uh, verbalizing some previously existing hypotheses, but the hypothesis was that humans, humans operate, they learn, and they make their uh, predictions through the through forming associations. That's why this was called associationism. So what are associations? Consider this. Lightning is generally followed by thunder. This is your experience in life. So eventually you begin associating lightning with thunder, not just the events, but also the temporal order. You sort of, so as a result, anytime you observe some lightning, your immediate expectation is that I'm going to hear some thunder now. Or if you hear some thunder, then you're going to see, you're going to think a lightning has struck someplace just a little while ago. So uh, we form these associations and the associationist uh, uh, school hypothesized that the way our humans, we operate is through this extremely large and complex mass, mass, mass of associations where we, we, we learn to associate the right things with the right things. And that by navigating these associations, we can make the predictions and the, and the uh, recognitions that we do. And as it turns out, this is actually a pretty good theory. In fact, if you mathematicalize it, most modern machine learning can be reduced to associationism. But this still doesn't explain the brain. Sure, we perform all of these operations through associations, but where and how does the brain store these associations? That question's question remains unexplained. So to understand how that operates, we have to go back and look at the brain again. 
And by the mid 1800s, it was known with the advances in microscopy that the brain is a mass of uh, interconnected cells of a special kind called neurons. And so whatever it does, the mechanism is hidden somewhere in this mass of interconnected neurons. Now, in this mass, each neuron connects out. The brain has many neurons, lots and lots. Each neuron connects out to many other neurons and each neuron is connected into by other neurons. So how does all of this enable cognition? The first person to come up with a reasonable model for this was this guy, Alexander Bain. He was like all of the scientists back in the 19th century. He was a polymath, he did everything. He was a philosopher, he was a mathematician, he was a logician, he was a linguist. And last but not the least, he was a professor, which was much harder in those days than it is now. So in his book, The Mind and Body in 1873, he suggested that the brain stores all of its information in the connections between the neurons. And not only did he come up with the suggestion, he actually came up with mathematical models. So he said that neurons excite and stimulate each other. And the same circuit, so the same set of connections is capable of generating different outputs based on different inputs. And he actually came up with examples. So for example, uh, here is this little network. This was dialect Spain. And uh, all of the uh, units here, circles here represent neurons. The math is Boolean. And you can see that if A and B fire, X will fire. If A and C fire, Z will fire, F, B, and C fire, Y will fire. So although it's just one circuit, different input patterns will result in different output patterns. Now this sort of thing is, firstly, this is a very modern neural network. So neural networks as we know them actually go back to 1873, they're old. But while it's very easy for us to, to imagine these days that uh, a network that, that is the same circuit can produce different outputs for different inputs. Back in Bain's day, this was heresy. People just thought it was stupid. And he even had more complex models where he showed that the same circuit can have different output patterns depending on the strength of the input. So here, for example, if the, uh, if the uh, input is, is weak, then Y, which gets three copies of the input, will fire with some delay. On the other hand, if the input is strong, both X and Y will fire. So different in intensities of the activation lead to differences in the out output. And again, uh, this is a very modern circuit. And back in uh, Hebb's day, it wasn't understood. Not only did Hebb come up with these exam models, he even came up with a model for how the network forms and learns to perform its computations. He said, when two impressions occur, concur, or closely succeed one another, the nerve currents find some bridge or place of continuity that travels according to the abundance, abund abundance of nerve matter available for the transition. So this is basically predicting heavy and learning, which we'll hear about in a few minutes. And heavy and learning itself was formally defined only in the 1940s. So Bain came up with Hebb's learning theory 70 years before Hebb himself did. He was extremely prescient. But then here was the problem. His ideas were uh, abnormal for his time. Nobody, it was people thought he was wrong to be, to, to be polite. And eventually even Bain began questioning himself. So as Bertrand Russell said, the fundamental cause of the trouble is that in the modern modern world, the stupid are cocksure, while the intelligent are full of doubt. And Bain began doubting himself. So in 1873, Bain postulated that there must be 1 million neurons and 5 billion connections relating to about 200,000 acquisitions or percepts. But then 10 years later, he realized that these, 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 these associations, these percepts don't just come in fully formed that they must be built over time. And so 
uh, he realized that he had not taken into account partially formed associations and that the number of neurons required to learn even just 200,000 acquisitions would be much larger than what he had, what the numbers he had here. And another 20 years later, he just recanted all his ideas. You know, the numbers don't add up, I'm sorry, I'm wrong, and then he died because he thought there just weren't enough neurons in the brain. And sadly for us, this sort of put back further research in the field by more than 30 years. But the fact of the matter was he was right. What he had wrong was his guesstimate for how many neurons were in the brain. The human brain has over 80 or 85 billion neurons and about 100 trillion connections, more than enough for everything Bain ever wanted to wanted the brain to do. And so his original hypothesis was right. The information, the brain stores its information in its connections. The human brain is in fact a connectionist machine where all of its knowledge, all of its ability to compute is, is stored in the manner in which neurons connect to one another. And so modern connectionist machines like a modern neural network emulate this connectionist structure. So here's what a connectionist machine is. It's a network of processing elements that are connected to one another. And all world knowledge is stored in the connections between these elements. Now, this is very different from your computer, your laptop, your desktop, or even your phone. Those machines are based on von Neumann and Harvard architectures. You must all have encountered this in, in, in college, uh, in some course, I'm sure. So in the von Neumann architecture, you have a processor, and then you have a separate memory structure and the processor reads its programs from the memory and the data from the memory performs it and performs its operations. The Harvard architecture, which is just an extension of or a minor modification of the von Neumann architecture actually has separate memories for programs and data. Now, either way, the cool thing about it is that if you want the machine to perform some new operation, you don't need a new machine. All you need to do is to store a new program in the memory and voila, it does the right thing. So which is why your little smartphone is able to do so many hundreds of different things. You don't have to buy a new smartphone every time you want to do something new. That's because within this architecture to make it do something new, all you have to do is to change the program. A connectionist machine is a completely different beast. A connectionist machine is one in which the program is in the connection between the units that form the machine. So the entire machine is the program. If you want a new program, you need a new machine, which is why when you want to actually implement a neural network, you won't actually build a neural network, uh, you will emulate it in a Harvard machine, Harvard architecture machine. And so a quick recap, neural network based AI has taken over most AI tasks. They originally began as computational models of the brain. Uh, and the earliest model of cognition was associationism. The more recent model is connectionist, where neurons connect to neurons, and the workings of the brain are encoded in these connections. So current neural network models are connectionist machines. I'll pause here for a, for a few seconds. Any questions? Questions, anyone? No, okay, let's move on, right? So here's what we have. This is a connectionist machine. It's a network of processing elements and all world knowledge is stored in the connections between the elements. So if you want to model this, the first thing you want to model, connections are easy. There's nothing up to connections. The key component are these elements themselves. These are units and the manner in which the human brain is constructed, these units are very simple. And we want to, to, to model this kind of structure, we need a model for the units. So first, since we are trying, we are sort of starting off with the brain, uh, can the connections be lost and how do we keep track of the connections? I'm not ex explicitly addressing that problem right now, but yes, uh, in the brain, the connections, in fact, 
uh, learning is a process of losing in your brain, which is kind of odd. And basically, when your brain begins to learn stuff, it's trimming connections. So you actually lose connections to learn stuff. It's, it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon. Now, in our computational model, of course, you can do anything that you want, right? Anyway, uh, let's begin by looking at the basic unit in the brain itself, which is the neuron. So this is what a neuron looks like. It has a big head, uh, which is, uh, are, are there or have there been other competing connectionist models than neural networks? If you have a connectionist model, that is a neural network, basically, right? Uh, at least the way we define it. So uh, it's, uh, it, this statement is, is tautologically true. Anyway, see, here's what the neuron looks like. You have the head, lots of signals, which we call uh, with a nucleus called the soma, and information comes in through a bunch of connections called dendrites. Now, when the total signal that comes in through all of the dendrites exceeds some threshold, then this neuron fires. Actually, it fires in spikes in proportion to the total input, but a simplified model is to think that it fires when the total input exceeds some threshold. That firing goes down this long leg called the axon down to other neurons. And this axon is the most important part of your neuron. And so it's protected by fat, a fat, a fat sheet, sheet called a myelin sheet. You're born with all the neurons that you're ever going to have, or almost all the neurons you're ever going to have. Your neurons do not undergo cell division. If you need new, new neurons, those have to be produced from neuronal stem cells, of which you have very few. So uh, uh, treasure your brain. You're not getting any, anything more. Now, the most important part of this entire structure is the fat that protects this long axon. If you lose this fat, the neuron dies. And so it turns out that the difference between really smart people and not so smart people often is not in the number of neurons in the head, it's the amount of fat in the head, the, the myelin that protects these neurons. And in fact, people have analyzed Einstein's brain and he found, they found that he didn't have more neurons than normal people. He had many more glial cells, the, the, the cells that form this fat sheet. So in fact, being called a fat head as a compliment, it means you're very smart are likely to be very smart. So we're gonna be uh, modeling this basic unit. And this unit is the first person, first people to model this unit were these two guys, Mekelo and Pitts. Mekelo was a professor in the University of Chicago. Walter Pitts was a homeless guy who just ended up at Mekelo's door. And uh, Mekelo took him in and they worked on that of all things. And they came up with the Mekelo and Pitts model for the neuron in this beautiful paper, which people still cannot fully understand because they use some very crazy notation, which was just invented by Pitts, a logical calculus of the ideas immanent in nervous activity, published in the Bulletin of Mathematical Physics in 1943. So this models the neuron as a basic threshold logic. It says, uh, the neuron reacts to the total sum of inputs and if the total sum of inputs exceeds some threshold, it fires. The specific, the specific model they came up with had different components. They had excitatory synapses, which transmits weighted inputs to the neuron. And it had inhibitory synapses where any, and the inhibitory synapse was different from other synapses in that if any signal came up over an inhibitory synapse, synapse then it, be, it, uh, it prevented the neuron from firing. It pushed the output to zero. And they showed with that with a simple model, you can compose any Boolean circuit. So here, for example, in all of these cases, the, a neuron fires if it gets two or more inputs. So here, if neuron one fires, then one unit of time later, neuron two, which gets two copies of one through these two connections, fires. So this is just a simple delay. Here, this neuron three gets two copies of one and two copies of two. So if either one or two fire, it gets a total input of two and it fires. So this is what, so three is one or two. Here, 
three gets a single input from one and a single input from two. So the only way three is going to fire is if both one and two fire. So this is one and two. This one, one sends in two copies of itself to three, but two is connected to three through an inhibitory synapse. So if two fires, then three is not going to fire. And so the only condition under which three will fire is if one fires and two doesn't fire. So it's one and not two. And once you begin composing these units, you realize you can compose pretty much any Boolean circuit. And so they showed that you can compose all kinds of really complicated Boolean circuits with this simple McLuhan Pitts model. But then it was kind of incomplete. They made some ex some exaggerated claims. They claimed their machine could emulate a Turing machine, which it cannot because it's finite state. And they didn't provide a mechanism through which their model could learn anything. Given it was able to emulate anything if you hand constructed it, but there was no way for it to learn to emulate a specific thing and build itself. For that, we had to wait for this guy, Donald Hebb in 1949. And uh, he proposed, Donald Hebb is another really interesting guy who was uh, various things, including a farmer at some stage of his life. So eventually he became a neuroscientist and he proposed this learning mechanism which said neurons that, neurons that fire together, wire together. So here's his model. Now, in, when two neurons connect, a neuron that connects through a synapse to another neuron connects through this axonal connection uh, uh, to the dendrite of the receiving neuron. And this connection is what is called a synaptic knob. And the larger this and the actual signals are sent through chemicals that go from the knob to the dendrite. Now, the larger this head, the more the chemicals that go through. And this has a specific property. If at any time this guy sends out some chemicals and this response, and then the head gets larger. So if neuron XI repeatedly triggers a neuron bar, then the synaptic knob connecting xi to y gets larger. If you put math to it, we can say that the weight of this connection increases every time both of these neurons fire at the same time, fire concurrently, or wi, which is the weight of this connection, equals wi plus some learning rate times x dot, x times y. And so the weight will increase every time both x and y are one. So this is the base famous Hebbian rule, and it's actually a very powerful rule. It's the basis of many learning algorithms in MM. But in this basic form, there's a problem with it. And what would the problem with something of this kind be? So anybody want to guess? What would be the problem with this guy? Anyone? It's very quiet. It's not circular. First, uh, to answer the question at 12.30, 30, uh, uh, neural networks don't subsume or subsume one one Neumann machines. Neural networks are a completely different structure from one Neumann machines. You can emulate uh, neural networks and one Neumann machines. Neural networks have this, their connectionist machines. They're a different architecture. Right? The problem with this one is that there is no way for a weight to decrease anytime X and Y both fire, W is going to increase. And so if you wait long enough, all of the weights are just going to go up and saturate. saturate. So this is an unstable algorithm, which will eventually give you, give you meaningless output. Still, it's a pretty good start. That was improved upon by this guy, Frank Rosenblatt, psychologist, logician, who invented the perceptron. So Rosenblatt was a, uh, Tragic story. He was he was he was a, a professor in Yale and died at the young age of 42 because he went sailing to celebrate his birthday, 42nd birthday, and drowned. Anyway, he invented something called the perceptron. A simplified model of his perceptron is this one here. It says it implemented basic threshold logic. The perceptron receives many inputs. Associated with each input is a weight. And it actually obtains the weighted sum of all of its input and compares the weighted sum to a threshold. 
if the weighted sum is greater than the threshold that fires, otherwise the output is zero. So mathematically, you can say the output y equals one if the weighted sum of the inputs plus a bias, which is the same as the negative of the threshold, is greater than zero. Otherwise, the output is zero. So this is threshold logic. And he showed, as we will see in a, in later in this lecture, that this threshold logic can achieve all kinds of amazing, uh, perform all kinds of amazing computations. And he was so excited by his own discovery that he sort of overstated what it could do. So he assumed that this could represent any Boolean circuit and perform any logic. He sold it hard, the newspapers bought it. Here's something from the New York Times of 1958, the embryo of an electronic computer that the Navy expects will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself and be conscious of its existence. Uh, the Oklahoma Times said Frankenstein monster designed by Navy that thinks this was funded by the, uh, funded by the uh, US Navy. And, you know, he not only came up with this model, he actually came up with a learning algorithm, which was a cool thing. This is very similar to the Hebbian rule, except in the Hebbian rule, you had this thing, the weight increased when both the output and the input fired together. But then if the output is already the correct output, you should not be increasing the weight. And so the minor modification that, that, that Rosenblatt came up with was that the term that multiplied X was not the output, but the error in the output, the difference between the desired and the actual output. And now this little learning algorithm actually provides you a natural learning algorithm, which can both increase and decrease the weight. And you can show that for certain classes of problems, this will learn the correct weights for the, for the perceptron to perform the operation that it, that is, that it is required to perform. And indeed, the perceptron can mimic any Boolean gate. So here, for example, this perceptron has a threshold of two. The numbers on top of the lines are the weights associated with those lines. This gate, this perceptron is going to only fire if both X and Y are one, because only then is the total input equal to the threshold. Does the total input equal to the threshold? So this is X and Y. Here, the weight is minus one. So if X is one, the total that in input that comes in is minus one, so this will not fire. On the other hand, if X is zero, the total input that comes in is you know, zero times minus one, which is zero, which matches the threshold and this will fire. So this is not X. You're actually able to model a, uh, a, a uh, negative. Wait. The label is in the formula. Uh, what is the question referring to, Orian? Question at 1237. Okay. Uh, all right. So now consider this third gate. What is this one? Anybody want to guess? What is this one here? Anyone? Guys, it's an odd, right? If either of these fire, the total input is one, it's going to fire. Exactly. So you can model any gate, but then here's the problem. A perceptron cannot model an XR. This was what Minsky and Papert showed. So in other words, uh, the uh, exaggerated claim that Rosenblatt had over here was wrong. It's trivially shown that it's wrong. And this sort of killed all interest in perceptrons and multilayer perceptrons and, and learning and such like for several, for, for a decade. But then Minsky and Papert also showed that while the individual perceptron can do a lot, it's actually a, a weak computational element. But then if you begin networking many of these together, you can do a lot more. So for example, if you want an XOR, an individual perceptron cannot perform an XOR, but then a network of three perceptrons can do it. So this, for example, I have this perceptron which computes X or Y, this perceptron which computes not x or not y, and then you add the two, the output is an x, x or y. So now the network of three perceptrons performs the, um, performs the Boolean operation. It's uh, the actual output that you want is only produced by these two guys, by this guy. These two neurons in the middle, they perform intermediate computations that you're not really interested in. 
and we don't even need to view. So this, so if it's, we call it a hidden layer. The term hidden layer did not originate with Minsky and Papert. This is something that came in much later. Anyway, so once you realize that uh, you know networking perceptrons in this manner can produce an XOR, then the concept of networking immediately uh, becomes much more powerful by connecting perceptrons in this manner. So this is what we call a not, this is no longer a simple perceptron, it's a multi-layer perceptron because you have two layers of perceptrons. A multi-layer perceptron can compose arbitrarily complicated Boolean functions. Like this MLP can compose this really hideous function of X, Y, Z, and A. You give me a Boolean function and I can compose it. And so the story so far is that neural networks which began as computational models of the brain are connectionist machines, which comprise networks of units. Um, the Mekelo and Pitt model, model neurons as Boolean threshold units, and model the brain is performing propositional logic, but gave no learning rule. Hebb's learning rule, neurons that fire together, wire together, did give you a learning rule, but it doesn't work. Rosenblatt's perceptron was a variant of the Mekelo and Pitt neuron, with a provably convergent learning rule, but individual perceptrons are limited in their capacity. On, however, multi-layer perceptrons can model arbitrarily complex Boolean functions. But then our brain is not Boolean. It's not working on Boolean inputs, it's, it's, uh, and we don't produce Boolean outputs. We actually work on continuous value inputs, real inputs, and we make non-Boolean inferences and predictions. So how does that square with this model? Now, these inputs are all real valued. X1 through Xn are real valued. And the weights are also real valued. And so now this perceptron is going to fire if the weighted sum of all of the inputs, which is a real value, exceeds a threshold. So uh, in fact, once I look at it this way, I can, I can say that this is the same as computing a weighted sum of the inputs and putting it through a threshold function. I can replace the threshold function with something else, like a, like a, uh, a smooth version of the threshold, like the sigmoid, and this would call it the, and you can view the output as the probability of firing, and it's useful to, but uh, this is just an FYI, I'm going to continue assuming this threshold gate because it provides really new nice intuition. So let's go back and look at this threshold gate. This thing fires if the weighted sum of the inputs exceeds the threshold. So when the weighted sum is exactly equal to the threshold, this is just a simple affine function. So if summation wixi equals t, that represents the equation of a linear hyperplane in the space. And this unit is going to put output a one, it's going to fire for all inputs on one side of the hyperplane, and it's going to output a zero for all inputs on the other side. And because the boundary between the two is a linear hyperplane, this is a linear classifier. If I, were, if I had two dimensional inputs, then this function is going to look something like this, the step function, this heavy side function, where there is a line. To one side of the line, the output is zero. On the other side, the output is one. And now when you see that a perceptron is basically just a linear classifier, you can see how it operates as a gate. So if I had Boolean inputs, then the, if I have two inputs, the inputs can only take one of these four values. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1. And now if I want an OR gate, I want something that produces a 1 for these three guys and a 0 here. So any perceptron whose boundary falls between this guy and this diagonal is going to give you an OR gate. Any perceptron whose boundary falls here is going to give you an AND gate. This one completely ignores the X and produces a NOT one. And now based on this, can anybody tell me why a single perceptron cannot produce, a, produce compute an XOR? Anyone? Why can it not compute an XOR? Basically for an XOR, this function has to go up and then come back down. So the XOR is, requires a one for the diagonal and a zero for the other diagonal. And you're right, if they are, if they are not linearly separable, if there is no, linear uh, boundary. So that's why a perceptron cannot 
compute an XOR. But once you begin connecting them together, crazy things can be done. So let's say I want to compose a, a, a network which produces a one inside this pentagon for any input inside this pentagon and a zero for any input outside. Here's how I do it. I'd give you one perceptron which produces a one on this side in the yellow region and a zero below. A second one which produces a one to the left of this line and a zero to the right. A third one for this boundary, a fourth one for this boundary, a fifth one for this boundary. And now when I consider inputs in the entire space, it's only for inputs that are precisely in the pentagon that all five of these guys will produce a one. So if I simply have another perceptron over here, which applies a threshold of five to their sum, this perceptron is only going to fire if the input is inside the pentagon, and it's not going to fire if the input is outside, and voila, you have this pentagonal decision boundary. But then once you can compose a pentagon, you can do something more, right? I could compose this boundary. So all I have to do, I have one subnet, which produces a one inside the lower pentagon, another subnet, which produces the one in the second pentagon. I have a final output which combines their output both and ors them. And this network is now going to produce a one if the input is in either of these two pentagons and zero outside. Now, once I do this, I know how to compose more crazy decision boundaries like this one here, or like a decision boundary shaped like a human or a decision boundary shaped like a horse. All of them become feasible. How? We'll see in a little while, right? If you haven't figured it out immediately, then I will show you how. And so when you look at the problem of classification, like deciding if a pattern of pixels is the number two or not, what you're really seeing is you're trying to model a boundary in some high dimensional space. So for example, if I'm trying to perform digit classification, uh, in the MNIST data set, every digit is a 784 pixel image. So this is a point in a 784 dimensional space. In that 784 dimensional space, there is some region which represents the set of all twos. And what we want the network to do is to model the boundary of this region. And we know how it can do it, right? And so adding to the story that MLPs are connectionist computational models and can model Boolean functions, we see that they are Boolean machines. They can represent Boolean functions over linear boundaries. They can represent arbitrary decision boundaries and they can be used to classify data. So, Given all this, what is the perceptron really model? Is there a semantic interpretation to what, what it actually models? Again, this unit fires if the weighted sum of inputs is greater than the threshold. So if I were to set all of these inputs as a vector, all of these weights also as a vector, the weighted sum is just an inner product between these two vectors, and the neuron fires if the inner product exceeds the threshold. Now, what can we say about inner products? Now, here's a crazy statement. In high dimensional spaces, where if you have a bound on the length of the vectors, then pretty much all the vectors are almost the same length. This has to do with the fact that as you increase the dimensionality of a hypersphere, more and more and more and more of the volume of the sphere lies very close to the surface. Eventually, when you get into hundreds of dimensions, basically the entire volume of the sphere is within a very is in a very thin and a very thin region uh, adjacent to the skin of the surface. So this means pretty much all vectors are the same length. So when I say that the inner product is greater than a threshold, we know the inner product is basically proportional to the length of the first vector times the length of the second vector times the cosine of the angle between the two. If all vectors are the same length, we can ignore the length. So this net, the unit fires if the angle between the two vectors is less than some threshold, basically. So what this means is that if I have the weight vector, if the input vector that comes in is within some angle theta of this weight vector, that's when the neuron will fire. So arithmetically, what this means is that the neuron fires 
if the correlation between the weights and the inputs is greater than a threshold. So for example, if I want to build a digit two detector, all I need to do is to set the weights of my perceptron in the, uh, arrange them in the pattern of a two. If the pattern of input pixels has a low correlation with this arrangement of weights, the neuron will not fire. But if it has a high enough correlation, where I can set my, choose my threshold, correlation threshold, it will fire. So basically the perceptron, individual perceptron, the correlation filters. So now when you look at an entire MLP, the MLP is a Boolean function over feature detectors. You have this, uh, well, not the input layer, the first hidden layer, this, this, this should be fixed, is a collection of feature detectors, which detect if uh, certain patterns have occurred in the input. And the network itself is a Boolean function over these feature detectors. So it's important for this first, the first layer or hidden layer to capture all of the relevant patterns so that the network can perform its magic on it. And so, but then you can look at it hierarchically. And the next layer of the network is like, again, is essentially a set of feature detectors on top of the feature detectors of the first layer. The higher level neurons compose complex templates from the features represented by the lower level neurons and so on. And so if you had a digit detector, which is looked at these LED patterns to detect if this, if this was a valid digit or not, you'd expect the first hidden layer weights to represent these patterns, which explicitly either compose digits or definitely do not compose digits. You'd expect the second layer patterns to explicitly capture digit-like structures and the final output only has to see if any of these guys are fired. This would be a perfectly plausible network for this problem. And so adding to what we've seen so far, perceptrons are correlation filters. MLPs are Boolean formulae where patterns detected by the perceptrons, where the higher level perceptrons may also be viewed as feature detectors. And in, in classification, the network will fire if the combination of the detected basic features matches an acceptable pattern for a desired class of signal. So, uh, but then we've looked at Boolean functions, we've looked at classification. What about regression? We know that neural networks can model any odd function if they can model sinusoids. So how is this, how is this possible? Now consider the simple three unit NLP which takes in just a single scalar input and produces a scalar output. These two are threshold gates. So this gate outputs a one if the input exceeds a threshold T1. This gate outputs a one if the input exceeds a threshold T2. These two are combined back with weights of one and minus one respectively and just simply added. So as X increases, when it's greater than T1, but less than T2, only this guy will fire and the output becomes one. When X exceeds T2, this guy will also fire. The two will cancel each other out and the output goes back to zero. So this is going to produce this pulse shaped function. But then once I can produce a single pulse, I can model any odd function. All I need to do is to combine a pack to, to aggregate a whole collection of these pairs where each one captures, gives you a pulse, uh, one little pulse here. And I can scale their outputs by the appropriate height. And I can approximate this continuous valued function using this collection of step functions. I can make this approximation as precise as I want to by making these individual steps narrow. So uh, this is, in fact, I've shown this for a, for a function of one input, but the same idea applies to a function of many inputs. Observe over here that we no longer guarantee uh, that it can exactly model the function, but we can guarantee that it, it can approximate the function to any arbitrary precision that you want. And so MLPs can also model continuous valued functions. In other words, MLPs are, can model Boolean functions, they can model any classifier, they can model any Boolean function, 
and they can approximate any regression. They are universal functions. So that's what an MLP is. Questions? Any questions so far? Questions, anybody? Yes, no? Okay. <laughs> no questions. So let me continue. Our next step, we know that a network can model anything, but what exactly can it represent? So let's go back and look at the threshold gate again. This unit fires if the weighted sum of inputs exceeds a threshold. I can write it like so. I can say the weighted sum of inputs minus t is greater than zero right? or equal to zero. And it outputs a zero otherwise. And Again, I can replace this. I can say that this is the application of a threshold function on this affine function of inputs. I can replace the threshold function with any, any other function like a sigmoid, and which is which kind of approximates a threshold. And I'm going to get some a, a, a unit which doesn't just merely produce Boolean outputs, but also something continuous. And once I do that, I can replace this guy with any other kind of activation. I could replace the sigma with a tan h. So you know these two are squashing functions. They take the entire input space and squash it to lie between the region 0 and 1, or between minus 1 and 1. But this function doesn't even have to be a squashing function, like your uh, rectified linear unit, or its softer version, the soft plus. But again, I'm going to continue assuming threshold activations for the purpose of uh, purpose of intuition, right? So now, when we, when we are speaking of multi-layer perceptrons, we are speaking of a network of perceptrons, and we are generally speaking of layered networks of perceptrons. You keep hearing the term deep neural network, then what does the term deep mean, and what does the term layer mean? I mean when I draw something like this, you can visually tell me what the layers are, but that's not how you define a layer, right? What is a deep network and how do you define a layer? So first, let's formulate those, let's define those. In any directed network of computational elements with an input source and an output sink node, the depth is the length of the longest path from source to sink. So here, for example, in this network, in this graph, there's a path of length one from source to sink, but there's also a path of length two. So the depth is two. Here, there's a path of length one, there's a path of length two, and there's a path of length three. So the longest path has length three. The depth here is three. So now when I'm speaking of neural networks, typically we will arrange the network in, uh, in, in this manner where neurons get inputs from other neurons. Now, the depth of the network is basically the length of the longest path from the input to the output. And if this depth is great, greater than two, the network is said to be a deep network. So if the depth is at least three, the network is said to be a deep network. But then what does it mean to have a layer? Now, uh, look at this guy over here. This one, when I draw it in this manner, the depth is obviously four because the longest path is four, even though there are shorter parts of length three and two through the network. But then let's define a layer. What is a layer? So a layer of neurons is the set of all neurons that are all at the same depth with respect to the inputs. So here, for example, these four red neurons are all at a depth of one with respect to the black neurons. So these four neurons are the first layer. These three green neurons are all at a depth of two with respect to the black neurons. So these three green layer neurons form the second layer. Not these three guys, not the, not the yellow, green, and yellow. The three green neurons form the second layer. The third layer are these two yellow neurons. These two yellow neurons are both at a depth of three with respect to the input. And so these are the third layer. And these two blue neurons, they all have, they're at a depth of four with respect to the input. So these guys 
from the fourth layer. So you can see how the layers, the formal way of defining a layer may not actually match your visual intuition. Anyway, so in a multi-layer perceptron, again, you have some inputs, you have several layers of neurons, you have an output. Now, inputs can be real or Boolean stimuli. The outputs can be real or Boolean values. But what can this network compute? What kinds of input-output relations can it model? And how is it related to the structure of the network? So we've already seen an MLP can compose Boolean functions, can compose real value functions. But are there any limitations? What are the limitations? So let's start with the Boolean function. How well do MLPs model Boolean functions? We've already seen a perceptron can model any simple binary Boolean gate. But then here is something more complex that a simple perceptron can do. It's a universal AND gate. This perceptron will only will fire if any of the first L neurons, first L inputs is one. Actually, no. Uh, it will only fire if all the first L inputs are one and all the remaining inputs are zero. If any of these guys is zero or any of these guys is one, it will not fire. So how's that? Let's set it at, at the target value. So if I make the first L guys one and the, the remaining zero, these weights are minus one and these weights are one, the total input is going to be L. So, it will, so if the target input is set over here, pattern is set as the input, the total weighted sum of inputs will match my threshold and it will fire. But then if I flip any of the first L guys, the total input N is going to become less than L. Similarly, if I make any of these guys one, because the corresponding weight is minus one, the total input is going to become less than L, and so it will not fire. So you have this rather complex function. Similarly, I won't actually explain this. You can figure this out from the slide. This perceptron will fire if any of the first L is one, or if any of the remaining N minus L neurons are zero. So similarly, this guy will fire if, any, if the total number of inputs that have value one are at least k. And it's easy to see why they have a threshold of k. So this is a majority gate, a generalized majority gate. This will fire only if at least k of the inputs are one. So you can see that you can compute all kinds of crazy functions, right? Uh, which, is, which is why Rosenblatt sort of got fooled into believing a perceptron could compute any Boolean function. But then we saw a, Boolean, a perceptron cannot compute an XOR. This one requires a multi-layer perceptron, right? But once you have NLPs, you can compute very complicated Boolean functions. You can compute any Boolean function. So NLPs are universal Boolean functions. What we mean by this is that if you give me a Boolean function, any Boolean function at all, I can compose an MLP that, uh, that uh, will construct it. To answer anonymous over here, the idea of feature directive. Uh, can you postpone this question till after the lecture? I will get back to that. That's a good question. Right? So we've seen that an MLP can compose any Boolean function, but then, how many layers in this particular example, you see that this to compose this function, we needed, we needed three layers. How many layers will I need to compose an arbitrary Boolean function? To answer that question, let's try representing Boolean functions in a slightly different way. Any Boolean function can be expressed as a truth table. A truth table is basically a table of inputs and output. You only need to represent the specific input patterns for which the output is one. For the rest of them, the output is implicitly zero. And now I can write a disjunctive normal form formula for this truth table. So the output becomes one. Being fired means the output is one, right? So otherwise, the, if it's not firing, the output is zero. We're speaking of Boolean outputs at this point. So now consider this. I want to say that the output must be one when I have this combination of inputs. So which is basically 
uh, not x. Uh, you, you can, you know, not x1, not x2, x3, x4, not x5. So that combination should produce a one. Similarly, not x1, x2, not x3, x4, x5 should properly produce a one. So this DNF formula is going to have one such clause for every input combination for which the output is one. And so uh, the basic, for the, this most naive formula will have as many clauses as there are input patterns for which the output is one. And now I can easily enough compute a, uh, and construct an NLP for it. I will have uh, one neuron for the first clause, one for the second, one for the third, one for the fourth, one for the fifth, one for the sixth. I order the lot and voila, I have constructed an, an NLP which computed this Boolean function. And because any Boolean function can be expressed as a truth table, any Boolean function at all, and because any truth table can be expressed as a DNF formula, a one hidden layer MLP can compose any Boolean function. A one hidden layer MLP is a universal Boolean function. But then if I want to compose my Boolean function using just one hidden layer, then what is the largest number of perceptrons required in this hidden layer, the worst case? for an n input, n input variable function. For that, let's look at the truth table in a slightly different way. So how many of you are familiar with Carnot maps? Anyone? You have a way of raising your hands, right? So uh, have you guys, at least some of you, Right, not all. Okay. A Carnot map basic is, is basically this topological way of representing input patterns and the output. Here, for example, this is a map of four inputs, W, X, Y, Z. And the, these rows represent all four combinations of W, X, and the columns represent all four combinations of, of Y, Z. Now observe that any two rows differ in only one bit. That's the way they've been arranged. So also any two columns are different only one bit. And you, can, you have to imagine that this first column is attached to the second column because they also differ in only one bit. The first row is attached to the last row because they also differ in only one bit. And so uh, it's actually a cylinder, it's not a sheet, it's, to, it's topologically continuous. And now the difference between, the, now each of these cells represents one complete combination of input bits. So for example, this guy here, represents 0, 1, w, 0, 1, 1, 1 for Wx and Yz. The highlights represent which of the inputs give you an output of one. And so in this truth table, there are seven input combinations for which the output is one. So if I were to compose a naive DNF formula for this, I'm going to require seven terms in my naive DNF formula and my one hidden layer neural, neural network is going to require seven uh, neurons in the hidden layer. But obviously you're not going to do this in this naive manner because uh, you know things can get real, things can be compacted. Now, any two cells over here, adjacent cells, differ in only one bit. So anytime you have adjacencies of this kind, you can begin grouping things. This entire column produces an output of one, which means this, you can group these four and say, it doesn't matter what W and X are, so long as y and z are zero, the output is one. So this entire column is going to give you a clause, not y, not z. Similarly, I can group these two guys, which says that uh, it doesn't matter what z is, so long as y is zero and wx is zero, one, the output is one. So this gives me not x, not w, x, not y. Similarly, I can group these two guys. In fact, I can group the four corners and I'm going to get one more class. So the, DNF compressed DNF formula for this truth table only has three clauses and the corresponding MLP is going to look like this. So, so long as I can begin grouping patterns in my, grouping these highlighted cells in my truth table in my Carnot map, I can keep reducing my DNF formula and reducing the size 
of the one hidden layer neural network that models this function. But then what arrangement of ones and zeros simply cannot be reduced further? Anyone? Is there a pattern that cannot be reduced? A chessboard, right? Something like this. There's no way I can group it. And so, how many neurons would I need in a one hidden layer? Hidden, how many hidden neurons would I need in a one hidden layer MLP for this function? Anyone? Eight, right? Because I'm going to need one for each class. And so this one is going to require eight. I'm going to need one neuron for each input pattern for which the output is going to be one. Just like we had three groups here. So we had three neurons here, right? I can construct a three-dimensional version of the Scarma map with six variables. This has 64 cells, but they cannot be grouped. And so if I want to compose a one hidden layer MLP to model this, form, this, this formula, it's going to require 32 neurons in the hidden layer to compose this formula. Is that clear to everybody? Raise your hand if it is. Right. Okay, so this is very simple, right? Does anybody recognize this formula? What is this actual formula? Anyone? First, if I have n inputs in the worst case, if I have a pattern of this kind, I'm going to require two raised to n minus one perceptrons in the hidden layer. So if I try to compose the function using just one hidden layer, the size of the network is going to be exponential in the number of inputs. But can I reduce the network if I use multiple layers? And to do that, we have to recognize these formulae. This is just an XOR, W, XOR, X, XOR, Y, XOR, Z. This is an XOR of all six variables. And we know that an XOR can be composed using only three neutrons. In fact, you can do it using two. So this one, I can have W, XOR, X, XOR the output with Y, XOR that output with Z. And I'm going to be able to do this whole thing using just nine perceptrons. This guy, it's the XOR of six terms, but there are five XORs. So I can do the same thing using 15 perceptrons. So here's the thing. If I have n variables, I'm only going to require three times n minus one perceptrons if I let the network be deep, if I have many layers in my network. So to compare, if I have a single hidden layer, this is going to require two raised to n minus one plus one perceptrons in all, including the output unit. So the size of the network will be exponential in n. Whereas if I let the network go deep, the size of the network is linear in n. So what is the minimum number of layers required for the size of this network to be linear in n? It turns out that I can arrange, this is an XOR. So I can, and the XORs are associated. So I can XOR these, the inputs in pairs, XOR their out, the outputs of this first, first layer XORs in pairs. XOR those outputs and then XOR those outputs and arrange the whole thing hierarchically. And because at each lady, at each stage, you're grouping them in pairs, then the total number of layers to go from input to output is going to be log base to n, where within each layer you have an XOR, so it's actually got two layers of neurons. So the total number of layers in this MLP is only two raised two times log to n layers. And if I am allowed to have these many layers in my network, then the network that computes this function is going to be linear in the number of inputs. Whereas if I'm only allowed to have one hidden layer, the network is going to be exponential in the number of inputs. What about in between? Suppose I give you a circuit. Instead of saying one hidden layer, I say you're allowed to have two hidden layers or three hidden layers. What happens? Then in the best case, basically what you're doing is that you're chopping this off at layer th layer two and saying after this, you can have only one more hidden layer. But then observe that this grouping is just going to is a hierarchy of XORs, right? So from that stage on, you're going to need an exponential number of neurons. So, which means that anytime I reduce the number of layers below two to two times log to N, 
the number of neurons is going to become exponential in the size of the input. And in particular, if I fix the depth of the network and make it independent of the size of the input, then the network is going to require an exponential number of neurons in the hidden layers in order to model the function. And, you know, if I try to go below the number of minimum number of layers, basically, uh, and say, I'm not going to you give you an exponential number of neurons, you simply cannot model the function. And so here's the case that deep neural Boolean MLPs that scale linearly with the number of inputs can become exponentially large if you recast it using a, only a fixed number of layers, not just one layer, fixed number of layers, where the number of layers is independent of the number of inputs and it gets worse. Suppose I have some crazy odd function and that function can eventually be restated as computing a bunch of variables which are finally XORed to produce the output. Then all of the logic that we just saw applies from this point on. And so from this point on, if you restrict the depth of the network, then the network is going to need an exponential number of neurons in the hidden layers in order to model the function properly. Otherwise it cannot model the function. On the other hand, if you let it go deep, then it can model the function using very few neurons. So in general, uh, depth is good. So I have some general statements over here. Let me skip over here. Uh, we'll skip these. An MLP is a universal Boolean function, but can represent a given function only if it is sufficiently wide and sufficiently deep. And depth can be traded off for some sometimes exponential growth in the width of the, new, of the network. And the optimal width and depth of the number of, depend on the number of variables and the complexity of the Boolean function that, uh, they, that they represent. So the story so far, MLPs are universal Boolean machines. Even a network with a single hidden layer is a universal Boolean machine. But a single layer network may require exponentially large numbers of positrons. And deeper networks may require far fewer neurons than shallower networks to express the same function. Now, questions? Any questions so far? Okay, give me a thumbs up if all is clear. Okay, all right. So Philip, can we know the necessary depth for a specific task? That is the challenge, right? The problem is this, this Boolean. Actually, let me, we've been speaking of Boolean functions. Things get more complex. Let's, 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 let's spend a little time, right? Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to eat up five minutes of your lunch time, guys, I'm sorry. So um, uh, you see MLPs, We've seen MLPs as Boolean functions, but what about real inputs? Now, an ML, you know, we, let's look at an MLP as a function that finds a complex decision boundary over the space of reals. We know how this operates. In the space of reals, a simple threshold perceptron is a linear classifier, and I can use it to compose any arbitrary decision boundary like this pentagon or this double pentagon. But if I want to compose these crazy boundaries, all I need to do is to decompose this boundary into uh, the union of many polytopes. I can model each polytope using uh, a simple two-layer MLP and then R them up and I can compose this polytope. So I can compose arbitrarily complex decision boundaries fairly precisely, right? But can I do this using just one hidden layer? And if so, how? So here's the question. How do I compose the decision boundary for this double pentagon decision boundary using just one hidden layer, like the one over here? So if there are not enough resources to model ne enough neurons, can we quantify the degree? Unfortunately not. These are all huge challenges, right? Because you don't know the function that you're trying to model. We'll get to that towards the end of this lecture. I'll take all the questions you can, you know, you can direct at me in these on uh, on these topics once uh, 
we actually explain the other restrictions, right? But let's look at this question here. Spend a few seconds thinking about how you could model this using just one hidden layer. Does anybody want to guess? How many neurons would it take? Does anybody want to give me a number? Anyone? No one wants to take a chance, right? Okay. So, all right. Number of inputs plus number of boundaries, not really. To see how this works, let's take a look at uh, some simpler problems. Say I want to model a diamond. Then I need four neurons in my hidden layer, right? So let's look at the sum of the outputs of these neurons as a function of the inputs. That sum is going to be four in the diamond. It's going to be three in these strips and two outside. So the function is going to look like this, right? If I want five, a pentagon, then I would do this with five neurons over here. And the sum is going to have this shape. If I use a threshold of five, the decision boundary is going to be a pentagon. If I use a threshold of four, the decision boundary is going to be a star. If I use, if I want to build a hexagon, I would have six neurons in my hidden layer. And uh, I can, now I can do this with just one hidden layer. The sum of the outputs of this hidden layer is going to have a fun, is going to look like this as a function of inputs. If I want a heptagon, the sum of the outputs of the one hidden layer is going to have this very beautiful shape. If I do a 16 sided uh, polygon, the sum is going to look like this. This is for 64 sides, this is for 1000 sides. So what we see is something very interesting, right? Let's go back and look at this, yeah. The sum over here inside is four and the lowest value is two. Here the sum inside is five, the lowest value is two. Here the sum inside is six, the lowest value is three. Here the sum, sum is seven, the lowest value is gonna be three. Here the lowest value will be eight. Here the lowest value will be 32. Here the lowest value will be 500. What you will find in general is that as you increase the number of sides, then the lowest value that you're going to see outside the body, this, this central region is going to be N over two, but something more interesting happens. And for that, take a look at the area that is N minus one. For four, the area that is N minus one, three is infinite. Here it is shrunk, it's, 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 it's finite. Here it's become smaller still compared to the region that has some six. And so as you keep increasing the number of sides, the area outside the polygon where the sum is neither n over two nor n keeps decreasing. And so in the limit, the actual function is gonna have this, as, as you tend towards infinite sides, it's going to look like this. It's going to be n over here, right in the center. And then it's going to sort of fall off very smoothly and very, very quickly become n over two. And in the limit for a small enough cylinder, this small enough uh, radius, this figure is just going to become an almost perfect cylinder, which means that if I use a very large n, n tending to infinity, then the sum of the outputs of these first hidden layer neurons is going to look almost like a perfect cylinder and inside the cylinder, n over two outside. And if I add an n over two bias, it's going to become an almost perfect cylinder with n over two inside the cylinder and zero outside. So that's, that's all I need, right? So now suppose I want to model this decision boundary that has two circles. Here's what I do. I construct one network, which has a very large network, which, is, which produces this cylinder where the sum is n over two inside the cylinder and zero outside. A second network would produce this, a second cylinder where the sum is n over two inside the cylinder and zero outside. The, the sum of the outputs of both networks is simply going to give you this structure, two distinct cylinders that don't interfere 
because within this cylinder, this guy has output zero, and within this cylinder, this guy has output zero, right? And now if I apply a threshold of n over two over here, the decision boundary is going to look like two circles. And so in general, uh, so this should not be k, this is just n. Okay, all right. If I want to construct this double polygon using just one hidden layer, it will turn out that the only way in which I can do it is to fill it up with circles of this kind and approximate it with a very large number of circles. And to make the approximation finer and finer and more and more precise, I'll have to make the circles smaller and smaller and more and more packed. And so in the limit, I can model this double pentagon decision boundary with just one hidden layer to arbitrary precision, but I will need a very large, in fact, infinite neurons to do so. So what this means is that a one hidden layer, it's not a one layer, but a one hidden layer MLP can model any classification boundary approximated to arbitrary precision. So a one hidden layer MLP is a universal classifier, but then here's what happened. Going from one hidden layer to something deep basically went from getting approximations with very, very, very large numbers of neurons to total precision with a very tiny number of neurons. So deeper networks can require far, far fewer neurons. Now, uh, let's just take a quick look at generic nets, right? Worst case decision boundaries. Consider this guy. I'll, I'll stop after this a little bit, okay? Consider this guy. Here is the decision boundary I want. I want a one in the golden regions and a zero in the black regions. So if I want to do this with one hidden layer, as we just saw, this is going to require, a naive construction is going to require infinite hidden neurons. If I do this with two layers, it only requires 56 hidden neurons. Why is that? It turns out that this entire pattern is composed of only 16 lines, eight in each direction. So I will need 16 neurons in the first hidden layer to capture each of these, in these lines. And then it turns out there are 40 of these yellow regions. So I'm going to need 40 neurons in the second layer to capture each one of these yellow regions. And then I just power the lot. And so with two hidden layers and one output layer, the total number of neurons is 57. I can compose this network using 57 total neurons. Whereas it, you know, one hidden layer, all I did was add just one more hidden layer and the number of neurons went down dramatically, right? But if I am willing to add even more layers, this can go down even further because this is just, if the first, the, the 16 neurons in the first layer, output variables y1 through y16, this pattern is just the XOR of these 16 variables. And we know how to compose an XOR network. This XOR network over 16 variables is going to require 45 neurons. So you need these 16 line detectors plus the 45 neurons. This entire thing can be, if I add more layers, it can be, it can be composed using 52 neurons. In this particular example, you don't gain a lot. But if I take something more complex like this guy, a one hidden layer neuron will require infinite neurons. That pattern is composed of 64 lines and with 544 golden boxes. So if I want to do this with two layers, it's going to require two hidden layers, it's going to require 609 total neurons. But once again, this is an XOR and the XOR actually will require, in fact, it turns out that I can do this with something like 180 neurons. So uh, it's not a very complicated pattern though it looks like it. Real life you know, problems will have far more complex patterns. So just going from two hidden layers to an arbitrary number of hidden layers, can reduce the number of neurons required by a great amount. In fact, if you work out that, you know, the worst case examples for large, for high dimensional networks, uh, high dimensional problems, you will find that while multi-layer perceptrons are universal classification functions, and even a network with a single hidden layer is a universal classifier, a single layer network may require an exponentially large number of perceptrons. 
where x may require an exponentially large number of positrons more than a deep one. And conversely, deeper networks may require exponentially fewer network neurons than shallower networks to express the same function. So deeper networks are just more expressive. Now, uh, just to wrap this up, we were looking at regressions, right? I showed how a uh, multi-layer perceptron can approximate any input, any function over one input to arbitrary precision, right? It turns out you can do this over any number of inputs, but it's just a little more complex than this. We saw an MLP can compose a cylinder, n in the circle, and n over two in the, in the circle, zero outside with the bias. So, if I want to get an arbitrary function in some high dimensional space, all I need is many, 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 many cylinder functions filling up the space. I scale up their outputs by the appropriate height and I can approximate the function that I want to arbitrary precision. So a one hidden layer MLP is a universal approximator. It can approximate any function at all, but then once again, you're going to find that deeper networks will require far fewer neurons uh, than shallower ones for the same approximation error. So I'm going to stop here because we're sort of going over time. Uh, and uh, yeah, there are Andre and Fernando. Is this the right time to start? You guys have a break, right? Yeah, it, it's, it's okay. Maybe we can stop for like 20 minutes, half an hour. What do you say, Vix? I can, I know it's up to you. You give me, tell me when we'll be back. I'll be here. Okay. Let's break for like 20 minutes if you, if you agree. Okay, 20 minutes. 20 minutes, guys. So I have 135. I'll be back at 155. Okay, cool. Thank you, everybody. Okay, see you.
I'm back. Is everybody back? 96. We're here. Okay. 155. You said maybe you wait for a couple of minutes for. Yes. There was a question. I'll take some questions for a couple of minutes while uh, we wait. There are some. St Any questions so far, guys? So when training a single MLP, no, it will not, right? That many cylinders approach is, is what you'd do if you just had a single uh, hidden layer. In practice, you have no guarantee what it will actually uh, end up learning. This, the business of what a network actually learns is, uh, is hard to characterize. So uh, again, ask me this question at the end of the lecture again. We'll go back to the double pentagon problem or the single pentagon problem. And uh, I can use that as an example for what really happens. Okay, so let me continue guys. So uh, I have a lot to cover. Now in the previous lecture, the previous discussion so far, we've seen that a single MLP layer is uh, a universal function approximator. What I mean by a single universal function approximator is that you give me a function and I can compose an MLP for it. It doesn't mean every MLP is going to model that function. It means it's possible for me to construct an MLP that will compute that function. And we also saw that more generally, deeper networks require far fewer neurons for the same approximation error. Now, uh, in fact, it can be exponentially fewer. So let's talk about sufficiency of architecture. This is an interesting topic. A neural network can represent any function provided it has sufficient capacity, but not all architectures can represent any function. So let's take a look at this uh, pattern again, which required 16 lines and then you know 40 golden boxes, right? So suppose I use a threshold uh, activation neural network. Now, instead of having 16 line neurons in the first layer, if I have only eight neurons in the first layer, can I compensate for having eight neurons in the first layer by having one trillion neurons in the second layer? And the answer is no. If I have less than 16 threshold neurons in the first layer, there's nothing I can do anymore that will actually capture this decision boundary exactly. Similarly, so, uh, and, and, and why is that? If I'm, if I'm using threshold activations, then each of these neurons is basically marking a boundary and it's going to tell me whether I'm to the right of the boundary or to the left of it, nothing more, right? So the kind of information you will have is, maybe you'll have information like this. It's going to tell you about which side of each of these eight boundaries you are on. So it can tell you whether you're in the first strip or the second strip or the third strip or the fourth strip but it cannot tell you where in the strip it lies because within this entire strip, all of the neurons will have the same output regardless of the position because the neurons are binary. Now, you know, maybe the fact that these eight boundaries are all parallel is part of confounds the issue. So what if I had eight threshold neurons which captured these eight lines? Even so, the only information I would be able to get once the input goes past this first hidden layer is which of these various regions the input lies in, but I will not may be able to make further distinctions within any given region. So for example, within this region over here, the outputs of all the eight neurons will remain the same regardless of where I am. I can move around and the output will not change. Similarly, so is this clear to all? Why having only eight neurons in the first layer is not going to be ever, ever going to be able to capture this pattern? So far I've had three people who raised their hands in response to questions. It's better than zero, anyway. Similarly, 
even if I have all 16 neurons in the first layer, but I have, if I have fewer than 40 or 41 neurons in the second layer, I'm not going to be able to capture this pattern because there isn't, there aren't enough neurons to capture all of these, uh, all of these XOR boxes. So uh, basically what this means is that it's not enough for the neural network to be large. You want the network to be sufficiently broad at each layer and sufficiently deep for it to be able to capture your pattern or it's not going to be able to capture the specific pattern that you want. But then there is a caveat over here, right? And what is the caveat? When I drew this figure, I, I was assuming that all of my neurons have threshold activations. If I have a threshold activation, then when I get past this neuron, the only information that this neuron passes on is whether I'm to the right of the threshold or to the left of the threshold. So if I have four neurons over here, the only information I will have is whether I'm in this blue strip or the yellow strip or the orange strip, the red strip or the green strip. It won't tell me in where in the strip I am in because regardless of whether I'm just adjacent to the boundary or whether I'm far away from it, the output of this first neuron is always going to be one. Similarly, uh, if this neuron captures this, captures this fourth line, regardless of whether I'm just adjacent to the line or whether I'm out here far away, the output is going to remain zero. So it doesn't tell you how far away from the boundary you actually are. And this is where having more useful activations kicks in. Suppose instead of a threshold activation for these neurons, I had something like a sigma. Now the output of the sigmoid is graded. The value changes as you move away from the boundary. This means that these four neurons will actually now pass, not merely tell you which side of the boundary you are, but also continue to give information to the subsequent neurons and in the, in the, in the neurons in the subsequent layers about how far away you are from the boundary. So it actually gives you a lot more useful information. And because you, these neurons are now giving you a lot more useful information, you will be at least able to make further the, the, the subsequent layers will actually be able to use this information to make further, uh, to obtain further discrimination in the patterns. Because this, these neurons, could, for example could, for example, could say that I'm going to draw another boundary when the input is, 0.2 away from the boundary according to the first neuron because that information is continued to be forwarded on. And so, uh, but even a, a sigmoid activation is kind of limited because when you go far enough away from the boundary, the sigmoid saturates and no more information exists about how far away you are from the boundary. So a more useful activation is one which continues to provide graded uh, output far away from the boundary. And so something like a ReLU or a soft class, which not only tells you which side of the boundary you are up here on, but continues to tell you how far away you are from the boundary, regardless of the distance from the boundary. This continues to convey information about the input because it, no, it is no longer gating the information. And that is information that the subsequent layers can build on to obtain more complex uh, decision boundaries. So the uh, consequence of this is that if you're using saturating or threshold activations, then having narrow lower layers can be a killer. It basically gates information and subsequent new layers, there's nothing subsequent layers can do to recover information and construct your patterns. But narrow layers can still pass information to subsequent layers if the activation function is sufficiently graded. But this requires greater depth in the network to permit the later layers to capture patterns. And so to just sort of wrap up what we've done uh, in the first session, MLPs are universal Boolean functions, universal classifiers, and universal function approximators. Even a single layer MLP can approximate anything to arbitrary precision. It could be exponentially or even infinitely wide in its input size. 
deeper MLPs can achieve the same precision with far fewer neurons. So they are more expressive. Right. Now, we know, any questions? Questions, anybody? No. Okay. All right. So we know that the neural network can approximate any function. But if you want to make the network approximate a function, you need to know the function. What happens in, in real life is that nobody gives you a function. Nobody gives you this you know, continuous curve and says, build me a neural network that approximates it. What you're really going to get is a few snapshots of the function training data where you get input output pairs which tell you for this input this must be the output for this input this must be the output and so on and you're supposed to learn this entire function from these training snapshots so and the way we do it is we try to construct a network which exactly computes this desired output at each of these points and we hope that if our network is able to capture the output exactly at these training points, then the network that does that also models the rest of the function. And so what we will do is we'll define some kind of an error or a loss between the actual network output and the desired network output at each of these points. And we'll optimize our network parameters to minimize this loss. And that's what we do using back propagation. And the hope is that by fit, fitting the network to these points, you get the correct function everywhere. But then here's the risk, right? The only thing you're really providing the network are these training points. So whereas the actual function you want to learn maybe this dotted line, there's nothing stopping you from simply learning this crazy red line as the function instead. So uh, given only these training instances, as far as the network is concerned, both of these functions and functions are identical. So we need additional smoothness constraints, additional constraints to try to sort of get a more reasonable function out of just fitting these small number of training points. So how few are your training points? You know, how many training points will we need to actually begin to get some reasonable approximation to the function. If you look at that, the answer is kind of ridiculous. Let's look at a very trivial problem. Consider a binary 100 dimensional input where the input is, has 100 dimensions and every component can take value either zero or one. So there are two raised to 100 or 10 raised to 30 possible inputs. Now, because the inputs are all binary, then all the in possible inputs are going to be the corners of this 100 dimensional hypercube. Now, if I want to learn a function on this 100 dimensional output input, I want to know the function value at each of these two raised to 100 corners. Now, suppose I give you 15, 10 raised to 15 training examples, 1000 trillion training examples to learn this very trivial 100 dimensional binary function from. Remember, in real life, your inputs are going to be, have far greater dimensions than 100, and the function is not even going to be binary, right? So for this trivial problem, suppose I give you 1,000 trillion training examples. These 1,000 trillion training examples are going to be, uh, to completely specify the function, I actually require 10 raised to 30 values. I need to specify the function value at each of these corners. So these 1,000 trillion training examples, which is, you know, we're going to see that many training examples in any problem, they are going to be off by a factor of 10 raised to 15 in being sufficient to specify this function. Basically, it's as if I'm giving you no training data at all. To give you an idea, suppose I give you 1,000 trillion training examples and I had some finite length for the edge of this cube. It doesn't matter how small. And then I put you in a little spacecraft and I randomly sit you on one of these edges and you're allowed to travel at close to the speed of light along these edges. And, I, and you begin wandering along the edges trying to first find one of the training points that was specified. 
the universe would end before you found your first training point. So that's how rare training data are. And it is, if I were to scale dimensions down, you're basically getting the equivalent of one, slightly over one training instance per dimension. And you're being asked to estimate the entire function from this one training instance per dimension. And as you can see, this is a completely ridiculous requirement to be making. So the uh, so how the how how do we deal with this? It turns out that first NLPs naturally impose constraints. They're universal approximators. So what happens is that if you take a network and you, and you have a fixed number of neurons and you make it deep rather than wide, then deep networks impose smoothness constraints and deeper networks impose more smoothness constraints than shallow ones. So for example, uh, if I had a network of this kind, the first hidden layer is going to produce some ugly function, but the second hidden layer is working on the output of this function. So the output of the second layer is going to be smoother than this guy. The third hidden layer is going to be working on the output of the second layer. So its output is going to be smoother than what is produced by the second function. So for a given number of parameters, if I just restructure the same parameters to be deep rather than wide, then the depth by, by nature is going to impose more smoothness constraints, which is more likely, with no guarantee of course, uh, which makes it more likely that you will learn something like the dotted function than the steeply increasing and falling red function. So here is a typical example of how that works. Uh, this is an example then, in this example, we are working with two dimensional data. We are trying to capture this decision boundary here, in this example, and this decision boundary here, except that in each case, we have drawn 1000 training points from the from these decision boundaries, which has drawn these samples and we're trying to learn the network. Now, a network for this pattern requires four plus four, eight, nine neurons. So we here we actually design an optimal network with exactly nine neurons. Same thing over here. And then try to learn the network using 1000 training points drawn from these samples, from, from, from these uh, pictures, from these decision boundaries. And here are the decision boundaries that the network actually learns. It doesn't matter how you train it, what training tricks you, you use, you're going to end up getting some garbage like this. But then, and if I make the network larger, things change, but how? So here again, I'm, I'm here, I'm using different decision boundaries. This is the, this hexagonal shape here, the decision boundary we want is this bear. We've here, we've taken, uh, many more neurons. We've actually taken 660 neurons. Here the 660 neurons are arranged in three layers. This is the decision boundary it learned. If I arrange it in four layers, this is three layers of 220 neurons each. These are four layers of 115 neurons each. This is what I get with six layers of 110 neurons each. This is four layers of 165 neurons. Six layers of 110 neurons, 11 layers of 60 neurons each. And you can see that with the same number of neurons, if I rearrange the neurons to be into a deeper network rather than a shallower network, I actually learn the target decision boundary much better. And in fact, if you look at it in terms of edges, in terms of weights, this has many, many fewer weights than this guy. And yet it's actually able to learn this boundary really well. Same thing here. When I try to learn this bare decision boundary, if I rearrange the 660 neurons in 11 layers, I get a much better estimate than if I arrange them in three layers. So one way to sort of deal with the learning problem is to deal th is through, uh, is by uh, arranging the network in terms of, dip in, by favoring depth in terms of width. So going back to the question of how, you know, how is depth useful? We found that making the network deep not only makes the network infinitely more or exponentially more uh, able to represent functions. In terms of learning, we also find that making the network deep rather than wide makes it much, much, much more able to learn functions.
than when the network is shallow and wide, right? So closing on that topic, questions, anyone? Any questions? Okay, so I'm going to move on to the final section of my talk, which is what does the network learn, right? Again, here's the problem of learning. You're given a collection of input output pairs. You want to learn the function. And so, and you have to learn this from just this data, right? Now consider a classification problem. In a classification problem, let's consider this double pentagon problem again. We want to learn this double pentagon decision boundary, except you're not going to be given the decision boundaries to learn. Somebody gives you these red and blue dots as your training samples. Red dots have class label one, blue dots have class label zero. And just from these dots, you have to learn a function. Uh, you have to learn this double pentagon decision boundary, right? Or the entire network has got to look like this. It produces a zero, an output of zero outside the double pentagon and a one inside. So how do you learn this? Now, learning this is hard enough, but then, uh, in reality, in real life, you're not going to get things like this. Here you have this beautiful example where there are no blue samples on the red side inside the double pentagon. And there are no red samples on the blue side. Real life is going to give you fuzzy boundaries. Your data is going to be more like the one to the left. And now, in this case, what function do we learn? So let's take a look again. Let's look at everything. Let's go back to our basic perceptron. Here is the function that a single perceptron learns. It's just a heavy side step function, right? But now, instead of being given this heavy side function to learn, suppose I were only giving you these training samples. So I've given you a bunch of red dots labeled one and blue dots labeled zero. And from just these samples, you now have to learn the function, this step function. How do we do this? Now, here's the function for our uh, simple perceptron. This looks at a weighted sum of the input, input components, and compares it to a threshold. If it's greater than a threshold, it outputs one, otherwise it outputs zero. Now, learning the perceptron is simply the same as learning these weights and the bias, this threshold value. So give it just these training samples, we have to learn these weights and the threshold value, right? Now, instead of having it, instead of having an explicit uh, weighted sum and this bias or threshold value, I'll recast it slightly. I'll extend my input with another fixed component whose value is one, whose weight is exactly equal to the negative of the threshold. And when I write it this way, basically, this is just a matter of convenience. Then I can say that. Uh, uh, this perceptron is going to output a one when a weighted sum of all of the inputs is positive and zero, zero otherwise, right? And now the problem is, how do I learn these weights? And, and of course, the weight of the n plus one component is the bias, right? So the problem is, how do I learn these weights given only these training data? Or, Alternately stated, how do I find the hyperplane whose equation is given by this formula here? The such that that hyperplane cleanly separates my training data into the uh, red into the instances with label label one and the instances with label zero, where one I believe is red and blue is zero. Now. Uh, we're all familiar with at least one algorithm which does this, which is the perceptron learning algorithm. Let's take a quick look at how that goes. So the problem is this, you're just given these collection of training instances. For each training instance, you're given the position and the label, where the label is either a one or a minus one. Instead of calling these guys zero, I'm gonna call them minus one, that's for convenience. And from these guys, you want to learn the weights of the hyperplane such that the hyperplane exactly separates the two classes. And the way we will do it, we're going to cycle through the training instances 
and we're going to only update the weight on misclassified instances. Now, here's something that we get. So I want to actually uh, show this, but it's easy enough that if I have a uh, perfect decision boundary, then the weight vector is going to be orthogonal to the decision boundary. And that weight vector is going to point into the positive class, the class label plus one. And so here's something. Uh, if I have just one training instance, then uh, the uh, best set of weights that guarantees that this weighted sum is positive is if the weights are the training instance itself, because then you're going to get summation xi squared, which is guaranteed to be positive. Similarly, if I have just one instance and I want that to be labeled as negative, then the best set of weights is simply going to be the negative of the sample values or of the, of the, of the vector. That way, each component, is each wi is going to be minus xi. And so this summation is going to be minus of uh, summation of minus xi squared, which is negative, which guarantees that this weighted sum is negative. And so the instance is classified as negative. So just using that uh, intuition, what we will do is we want the ideal weight for a positive instance is the instance itself. So anytime I find that an instance, positive instance is misclassified, I'm going to drag the weight vector towards that instance by adding it to the weight vector. If the ideal weight for a negative instance is when the weight vector points exactly opposite to the instance. So if a negative instance is misclassified, I'm going to push the weight vector in a direction exactly opposite that instance. And so here's how uh, the perceptron learning algorithm works. You'd randomly initialize some hyperplane. So this is the weights for the hyperplane. And this hyperplane is going to be classifying your training points. It correctly classified these red guys but it misclassified these red guys. It correctly classified these blue, wait, it correctly classified, is it how it looked? Yeah, it correctly classified these, these blue guys as one, but then it misclassified these red ones as also one. It misclassified this blue one as minus one, but it correctly classified these red instances as minus one. So now let's cycle through the training points. If you cycle through the training points, you're going to find that all of these guys are correctly classified, nothing to do. But then you find that this training instance is misclassified. So for this training instance, the ideal weight vector points directly at the training instance. So what we will do is to add that vector to the current weight vector. And this drags the weight vector towards this training instance. And that naturally changes the decision boundary to the to this position over here. And when you change the decision boundary to this position, now this guy and a whole bunch of others are going to be correctly classified. Now at this instance, you're still left with this one red training instance, which is negative, but is being classified as positive. But then we know that because this is a negative instance, the, the ideal weight vector for just this instance is going to point exactly away from that instance. So we are going to add the negative of this vector to the current weight vector to give the new weight vector. And that will change the decision boundary. And now you have this new decision boundary which correctly classifies all the training instances. So it's a very simple algorithm, the Perceptron learning group. And it has this guarantee that if your data are linearly separable, meaning they can be separated by a hyperplane, then the perceptron learning rule is guaranteed to find this hyper, find a separating hyperplane in a finite number of updates. Meaning after encountering no more than R over gamma squared misclassification, where R is the length of the longest training point and gamma is the margin of the best case classifier, then uh, in no more than R over gamma squared misclassifications, the perceptron algorithm will find a correct decision boundary, right? 
So, but then in reality, you're never going to get linearly separable classes. What, will, what you will find is classes that are somewhat separable, but you're going to get some noise. So for example, you might find a red dot in the green, in the blue region, it's kind of green here for some reason, and a green dot in the red region. So basically you have some red dots suspended over these uh, minus one class and blue dots on the floor. You have the plus one class. And so now there is no hyperplane that cleanly separates the two classes. In this case, the perceptron learning rule is no longer going to work. Now, to understand what this means for us when we are working with neural networks, it's more convenient to sort of back off to a one dimensional example for visualization. So here the data are all just one dimensional. Every instance over here is either class zero or class one. So these are all the class zero training instances and these are all the class one training instances. For one dimensional data, the linear separator is a threshold. And we can see that there is no threshold that clearly separates the blue class from the red class. On the other hand, if you wanted to draw, or, you know, if you wanted to construct a multi-layer perceptron using this training data, we know a multi-layer perceptron is a universal classifier. So the multi-layer perceptron could well just end up learning this very ugly function. Now, is this the function that we really want? If you are given data of this kind, odds are that this is not really the function you want. And then there's more to it, right? Suppose I have training data of this kind, where I have a bunch of training instances which have exactly the same X value, but some of them are labeled one and the rest are labeled zero. Even if you're willing to learn a function of this kind, what is the value that you would, that you would want for this particular training set of training instances? Now, just as you imagine that at that location, you have 90 training instances, which have value for which the label is one and 10, 10 training instances, which are labeled zero. So do you want the network to just output a one because red dominates, or do you want to output it, out, want it to output a 0.9 because 90% of the instances are red? Clearly the 0.9 is a lot more intuitive and a lot more reasonable as what the network must output because it is an estimate of the a posteriori probability of the red class given the input x. So this is potentially much more useful than a simple one zero decision and also much more realistic. But then if we concede that in this specific situation where you have all of these inputs which have exactly the same x value, the correct answer to output is 0.9. Now I give you this situation where I still have 100 training instances, but they're no longer exactly the same. They're all infinitesimally off, maybe 10 raised to minus 20 jittered with respect to one another. In this case, does it suddenly become reasonable to have this function which is jumping up and down? Or does it, does it make re still make sense to have 0.9 as my desire, as, the, as what I want the network to output? And clearly, you know, intu intuition tells us that for this situation, once again, 0.9 is a more reasonable guess to be, uh, a more reasonable output for the network because it, carries information about the, the, the jitter is so small that it's essentially insignificant. And the point nine still carries information about what fraction of instances in a small neighborhood have the label one. But then we've just progressed from considering the label at just one location to considering the label in a small neighborhood. And so going back and looking at things in terms of neighborhoods, looking at the original problem in terms of neighborhoods, things begin to look different. So at each point, although I'm given all of this training data, to find out what my target value is for the function, I'm not going to look at individual data instances. I'm going to look at a small neighborhood around a small window around each training instance. And I'm going to plot 
the proportion of instances in that neighborhood which have a value one. And that proportion is going to change like so. Initially, all the instances are zero. Then as you go left to right, the number of instances of one is going to keep increasing. And eventually when you get to the far right, all instances are one. So now when you plot this curve, this curve is going to have this sigmoidal shape. And what you really want your network, your, your function to output is no longer, is not this spiky up and down thing that we just saw, but rather the smooth curve, which goes from, uh, which gives you what fraction at each point, what fraction of inputs in a small neighborhood of that point have the value one. And so this is the function you want your network to model. Now this function has a very nice, uh, in fact, there are, there's a very nice function which captures exactly the shape. And that is the sigmoid, the one that you're all very familiar with. And this sigmoid naturally gives you the structure over here that as you go, you know, you can either go and have it rising left to right or right to left, depending on the sign of this weight that we want. And so as at one extreme, it's going to give you output zero. Then as you head from one extreme to the other, at some point it begins outputting increasing values in a nice smooth curve till eventually it only outputs once. So this sigmoid actually models this target behavior that we want very nicely. And so when I consider a standard perceptron, which has a sigmoid activation as opposed to a threshold activation, it has a weight for the input and it has this bias. The activation function itself is a sigmoid. This is what I'll call a sigmoid perceptron. Now, a sigmoid perceptron with a single input models the a posteriori probability of the class given the input, a sigmoid perceptron but the single single input basically models the blue function, the function shown by this blue curve. Now, from one, instead of looking at one dimensional inputs, now let's just take a next step up and look at two dimensional examples. So in a two dimensional example, you're gonna have data of this kind. You have two dimensional data and you're going to have uh, the linear threshold decision boundary would be if you were to have a, uh, a perceptron modeling a step function, then the function is going to have something of this shape. The function's shape is going to be something of this kind. If you were to draw, draw a decision boundary between the blue and the red classes, it would be a, if you were if you were to draw a linear decision boundary between the blue and the red classes, it would be something of this kind here, yeah? like this line here, except that the training data you get are going to have some blue dots on the red side and some red dots suspended on the head, in the air on the blue side. And so now the function that makes more sense in this two-dimensional case is going to be this two-dimensional version of the sigmoid, which is this folded sheet, which goes smoothly from zero and goes up to one. And this is nothing more than a perceptron with a sigmoidal activation and two inputs. Now this perceptron, once again, it's giving you the a posteriori probability of class one given the input. But if you were to force, if you were forced to take a hard decision and asked to unequivocally state whether it was a one or a zero, what you would do is apply a threshold to this probability. Basically, you know, you might say for instance, if this probability is greater than 0.5, I'm going to call it one. If it's less, I'm going to call it zero. And then if you look at the locus of points where this probability is exactly that threshold, you're going to find that that locus is an exact hyperplane. So even though the function it models itself, the function itself is this curved sigmoidal sheet, the actual perceptron continues to model a linear classifier. So now our problem is this, you're speaking of learning the model, right? 
I have all of this training data. Basically, given you're given many x y pairs, and our job is to estimate the parameters of the sigmoid. This bias w zero and the weight w one that best give you the, that give you the best shape to model the a posteriori probabilities of the classes. Now, let's see how we can do this. To do this, I'm actually going to uh, use a one minus one notation again. So the, the two classes are either plus one or minus one. And now it, this red curve gives you the a posteriori probability of class one given the input. So one minus the red curve, which is this blue curve is going to give you the a posteriori probability of class zero given the input. And if you work out the arithmetic, so the red curve has this formula over here, one over one plus e raised to minus of w0 plus w1x. The blue curve has this formula over here, which is one over one plus e raised to plus w0 plus w1x. Again, if you work out the arithmetic, you'll find that this guy here is simply one minus this term. And so, uh, the probability of y being one given x is given by this formula here. The probability of y being minus one given x is given by this formula here. I can write them in you know, using one combined formula saying the probability of any y given x equals one over one plus e raised to minus of y times w zero plus w one x. And you can see that when y is one, this formula becomes the same as this guy. And when y is minus one, the formula becomes the same as this term over here. And so now we're given this problem. We're given all of this training data where x's are vectors and y's are binary. This should be plus one, minus one class values. Now, if I'm given a collection of data, I can use the maximum likelihood estimation principle to learn the distribution parameters of the distribution of the data. Now the total probability of all of my training instances is the product over all of the training instances of the probability of the individual instances where each instance is an X, Y pair. Using Bayes rule, I can write the joint probability of X and Y as P of X times P of Y given X. And so, this total probability of all of my training data is the product over all of my training instances of the probability, the a posteriori, a priori probability of the x component, the input for the training data, times the, the posterior probability of the class given the input, which we are modeling using this sigma one over one plus e raised to minus y times this w0 plus w, w1x, right? So this is the total probability of my training data. Now I can, if I take the log, that simply become, I can, I can separate out this, the, the two terms that are being multiplied on the left, on the right hand side. And so it's going to be the sum over all training instances of the log of p of x minus the sum over all training instances of the log of this denominator, because the minus is because it's the denominator. And now if I use a maximum likelihood training principle to learn the distribution of the data, I would be estimating the W, the, these weight parameters that maximize the log likelihood of the training data. And again, this first term is not a function of the parameters. The second function has a minus outside so maximizing minus summation something is the same as minimizing summation something. So I would be, I would be estimating these weights as the, the values that minimize the log of the sum over all training instances of the training instances of the log of the denominator of the sigma. Why have I just bored you with all of this math? It turns out that this is exactly the same as minimizing the cross entropy between the desired output y and the actual output of the of, of, of the sigmoid. 
which is this term here. And so when you train, you can't directly optimize it, you need gradient descent. But basically what we find is, you know, when you're training your neural networks over the next few days, you'll find that you keep minimizing the cross entropy between the target output that you want, the desired output of the network and the actual output of the network. And what I want you to keep in mind is that what you're really doing is modeling the distribution of the data because minimizing the cross entropy is the same as maximizing the likelihood of the training data. So you're actually performing maximum likelihood training and you're learning the parameters of a distribution for your data. Now, all of this was explained in terms of this one dimensional and two dimensional problem where we were using a single sigmoid which modeled a linear classification boundary. But what if you have something more complex like this double pentagon problem where our labels are fuzzy? Now, before considering this, let's look at the simpler case. Let's consider the double pentagon problem again, except now we are given just these dots and they are well separated. There are no blue dots on the red side, there are no red dots on the blue side. And now we have to train a network to model this decision boundary. And we know that this decision boundary can be modeled using a network with this architecture, one subnet for the first pentagon, a second subnet for the second pentagon, and a final output neuron to call them both. So this is a sufficient net. Now, if I construct an, an, an exact network of this kind to classify this data, what's happening? To understand, let's look at what happens at the final output neuron. The final output neuron is a perceptron. It could have a sigmoid uh, activation, but nevertheless, this one is a linear classifier. So if this perceptron is a linear classifier, and if this network is perfectly classifying the red and the blue dots, so if it's doing a perfect job, then it means, then, then what does this tell us? about the inputs that this final perceptron is getting. It tells us that by the time all of this data has gone through this network and arrived at the final perceptron, because the final perceptron is a linear classifier, in the y1, y2 space, these blue down, these training data are now linearly separable. So, if I if I'm able if I have a network which perfectly classifies these data, then it means that the output neuron of the network, the features seen by the output neuron of the network, are in fact perfectly classifiable, which in turn means that the, the rest of the network over here took this data which had this very strange distribution, so that one class lay within a double pentagon and the other class lay entirely outside it and rearrange the data. It moved them around so that by the time it got up to here, the two classes are now linearly separable. So the network actually has two components. It has the entire network until the penultimate, until and including the penultimate layer of the network. So everything up to the output layer. And this is a function which takes these data which are distributed any odd half and rearranges them so that the classes are now linearly separable. And then there's a final linear classifier which actually performs the separation. And so when you, when you think of it this way, you can think of the two component model, which is a, one is a feature extractor which extracts linearly separable features. And the second is a linear classifier, which can be any odd linear classifier, it could be a perceptron, it could be a max margin classifier, you name it, right? So, and this is true, not just for, uh, you know, sufficient or exact structures for a problem. If you pick up any architecture that is capable of classifying this data perfectly, when this architecture learns to classify the data perfectly, what has happened is that the network until, but not including the output layer. There's a feature extractor which extracts linearly separable features from the input. 
and that is passed through a, a, a linear classifier. Now suppose the network that you have does not have sufficient structure. We know that for this problem, a sufficient structure over here needs 10 neurons in the first hidden layer, two in the second hidden layer, and a final output neuron. Suppose I had only nine neurons in the first hidden layer. This network, as we saw, is no longer going to be able to perfectly separate these two classes. So in that case, what happens? The network is still going to try, try to transform the inputs into linearly separable features. So as a result, if the network had, if this portion of the network didn't have sufficient uh, structure, sufficient architecture, then at the output of this network, even in the best case, you're going to find some blue dots on the red, uh, on the red side and red dots on the blue side. And the learning algorithm is still going to try to learn uh, the most, the best decision boundary for these now inseparable classes. And the overall learning is going to, even with the insufficient structure, is going to try to learn the lower networks such that it maximizes the linear separability of the classes, such that the output network neuron can do the best job it can. So, Mathematically, uh, the uh, data, what this does is regardless of the structure of the data, regardless of the nature of the, whether the, data, whether the data, the structure of the network, regardless of whether the data are actually cleanly separable or not, this network can be thought of as the, the, the uh, a uh, network can be thought of in this manner. The output of the network, if, it's, if you're using a sigmoid activation, is a sigmoid computed on the features extracted by the portion of the network in the gray box. And the network until the second to last layer is a nonlinear function that converts the input space into the feature space where the classes are maximally linearly separable. This is regardless of whether the network has sufficient structure and whether the data are truly separable or not. So where the data are not truly separable and the boundaries are not linear like this one, then this portion of the network is going to end up transforming this data into something like this. The feature extraction layer transforms the data such that uh, to uh, it's maximally linearly separable and moreover, because this output network is a sigmoid, a logistic function, that's going to transform the data such that the posterior probability of the class can now be modeled by a logistic. So it's going to sort of transform the data such that, such that, the post, such that in the transformed feature space, the posterior probability can be modeled by a logistic. And the output logistic now computes the posterior probability of the class given the input. And so, even when you have data that are not really separable or when they're not linearly separable, regardless of the nature of the data itself, the problem, and regardless of the nature of the network, the network is still going to try to output the a posteriori probability of the class given the input and subject to the biases, the, the, the induction biases that are imposed by the structure of the network. So for multi-class networks, it will actually be a vector of a posteriori class probabilities for all the classes. And so the story so far is that a classification MLP actually has two components, the feature extraction network that converts the input into linearly separable features or near, nearly linearly separable features. And a final linear classifier that operates on these nearly separable features uh, compute and computes the a posteriori probability of the classes. So David, uh, which figure are you talking about? I missed the question. 
I have two questions over here. When training a single layer MLP, if I'm having a, I would have a single hidden layer MLP, right? Uh, and so that's an older question. So this is one. Uh, where do you see a horizontal line separating the two classes? Can you point to the slide? This was uh, during the, the sigmoid part. Yeah? yeah. No, so the, 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 the y axis is the label. Right? So the output. So y is not input to the network. X is the input. So if you have a, want a horizontal line, then if you want a line of this kind out here, then the input has to be the combination of X and Y. You don't get that, right? Y is the output. The input is X. Right? So a classification MLP basically comprises two components, a feature extraction network that converts inputs into linearly separable features and a final linear classifier that operates on the linearly separable features. So we've discussed what happens at this point, right? But what about below this point? What about the rest of the networks? How do the rest of the network, how do the lower layers respond? Now you can think of these two as computing features, but what do they look? What do they look like? So there's a very nice hypothesis and a bunch and a bunch of papers by Benji at all, which basically show that what happens is this, the manifold hypothesis that shows that for uh, which says that when you have separable classes, like in this case, here, the classes are separable. They're just not linearly separable, right? So for situations such, such as these, the, uh, the uh, hypothesis is that there's some nonlinear curved surface in some high dimensional space where the data are in fact linearly separable. And what each layer in the network is doing is folding and unfolding and straightening this manifold to increase. Uh, so you have this curved manifold on which the data are separable, linearly separable. And as you go through the network, it sort of straightens these manifolds so that by the time you get to the output layer, you now have a, have a linear manifold on which the data are linearly separable. So alternately stated, as you go through the network, the, the data becomes increasingly linearly separable. To see an example of that is if that is indeed the case, let's look at a couple of pictures. In this case, I'm trying to learn a circular, this thing is misshapen. I'm trying to learn a circular decision boundary of this kind. There's just one hidden layer with three tan H neurons and a single neuron output layer. And this has been the network is supposed to tell me uh, if the if any given input is inside that inside the blue region, the circle, or outside. Now consider what the network looks like. The first thing that you do when you operate on any input is to compute an affine function of the input, which is a weighted sum plus a bias. So that's an a fine transform of this two dimensional input, which takes it from two dimensions and puts it in three dimensions because I have three neurons in my hidden layer. So it's going to take this two dimensional plane and put it in and make this a two dimensional plane in three dimensional space. Then when I apply a tan H activation to it, the tan H activation is going to sort of modify each component and change and to the by applying a tan H to the value over there. So when that happens, this shape is going to become something else like this curved shape. Then in the final output neuron, the first thing you have a three dimensional input and it's first thing it's going to do is to compute an affine function of a three dimensional input, which is a scalar. So all of my training points are going to become just one value against a single axis. And then the final output neuron is going to apply a threshold on the scalar and decide 
if the output is a zero or a one. So when I first initialize the network, the initial network puts this two dimensional plane over here. The tan h converts it to this figure. Then the affine function at the output neuron zaps this picture down to this line. And then when I apply a threshold to it, in the input space, that threshold corresponds to this curve, which is not a circle at all. But then as training, training progresses, just see what happens. What you're doing is the affine function in the first layer picks up this two-dimensional surface and keeps moving and orienting, orienting it until it finds some perfect position in the 3D space, such that when you apply the tan H to it, all the blues get stretched out in one direction, all the reds get compressed in the other direction, so that subsequently when I zap this three-dimensional figure down to a one-dimensional value through an affine, 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 affine transform, this three-dimensional figure gets collapsed to this picture here, where all the blues occur on one side, and all the reds occur on the other side. And now I can apply a threshold here, which clearly separates the blues from the reds. And then if I go back and look at what decision boundary is actually implied in the input space, you can see that it actually begins looking pretty close to a circle. This is a very simple method. It's only three units because we wanted to be able to visualize it. But you can see how, as the data goes through the network and as training progresses, it's sort of finding the appropriate transform of this input such that by the time it gets to the output neuron, the two classes are linearly separable. And as you go through the network, uh, in this example, you see that this is happening, but here's a better example. This is CIFAR 10. This is a 11 layer network, three, four, five, six. So it has 11 hidden layers and We've taken CIFAR 10 or high dimensional data. So we've projected this down to two dimensions using PCA just for visualization. When you just initialize the network and look at each color represents a different class. So when you just initialize the network and look at the two dimensional scatter of all of the data, they are heavily overlapping, right? But then as training progresses, see what happens. Eventually, when the model is learned, initially the data are all mixed up. But then as you go through the layers, the classes begin to get increasingly linearly separable until by the time I get to this layer, they are almost perfectly separable. The next two layers just sort of polish it up a bit to make the classes linearly separable. So, uh, and the training actually achieves this. Now, this is a two-dimensional representation, right? Let me let me show a three-dimensional version of the same thing, where now we projected the data down to three dimensions for visualization. And once again, you can see that as the data goes through the layers, each layer increases the linear separability of the classes, such that by the time you come out here, the data are already perfectly linearly separable, and then a linear classifier can separate the classes. And so, Basically, what we have over here, what do the lower layers of the network learn? The lower layers of the network, to answer this question, each as you go through the network, the final classifier can only separate linearly separable classes. And so as you go through the network, each of the layers increases the linear separability of the classes until by the time you get to the final layer, the classes are perfectly linearly separable, if the deep are as close to perfectly linearly separable as possible. So, questions? Question? Any questions? There are a couple of questions in the Q&A. Okay, what are those? So the, the last one is, what is the intuition for why the nonlinearity in the activation functions is essential? Okay, so here, let's go, uh, let's take a look at this figure, right? I'll stop it here. 
see what happened over here, right? Now I start off with two dimensional input. And so the two dimensional input is just gonna be two dimensional plane. The first step is to sort of take this two dimensional plane and put it in a three dimensional space. Now what happens, what does the non-linearity do? The non-linearity sort of stretches the space. So it's so because it's a tan H, the tan H is going to pull some components up and push some components down. As a result, this tan H is going to pull the center of the circle up and push the boundaries of the circle down. That can only be done by a nonlinearity. And as a result of that, you end up with the situation here where You can see that the blue region has been pulled up and the red region has been pushed down such that now I can slice the three-dimensional space with a hyperplane, with a linear hyperplane, which pulls out the blue from the red. This could not have been achieved without the nonlinearity. Is that making sense to you, Miguel? Okay, so did that answer the question? Yes or no, guys? Okay, done. So this, so without the nonlinearity, this is just not gonna happen. This is absolutely key. The whole job of the nonlinearity is to distort the space because it's all about linear separability at each point. If all the operations are linear, if your data are not linearly separable, they will never be linearly separable. So what you need to do is to, find, so look at what is happening over here. The tan H is a fixed operation. So there's a specific orientation of this hyperplane in the three dimensional space, which allows the tan H to pull up the circle and push down the boundaries. And the entire process of training is about groping for this orientation in this three dimensional space, such that when the tan H does its thing, the blue and the red separate linearly. So, uh, the non-linearities are fixed and all the linearities, the job the linearities do is to try to position the data in the space such that the non-linearities non can do their magic. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Um, my question is, this, this is a bit of a way back in the talk, but could you explain a bit further the intuition behind the smoothness constraints that come with the network depth? Are there situations in which the data is such that deeper layers do not enforce smoothness? So uh, there's, wait, it has to be way back when. Okay, so there are restrictions, right? Here's what happens. As you, well, each layer is actually going to be smoothing out the, the it's, I, again, you have the you have you have the entire business of non-linear non-linearity, etc. But each layer, the first layer gives you some ugly function. The next layer smooths it out. The next layer smooths it out. Eventually, you're going to end up in some region of the space where the subsequent operations are purely linear, because even non-linearities have linear regions, right? Yes. So if you end up, say, at this point where all subsequent operations are in the linear domain then these guys really are not going to achieve anything. So uh, it is, uh, uh, there is a point of diminishing returns beyond which the depth doesn't really help you. The, quest, the problem is we don't know where that lies. So that's where the empirical search ends up working. I mean, all empirical studies seem to show that simply because you have these two different aspects. One is what is optimal and second is can you find it, which is the training and search. Uh, all the studies that we know seem to indicate that over designing it, making it as deep as possible, and then learning gives you the maximum chance for learning something useful. But the uh, point that remains is that as you keep increasing the depth, the function actually becomes smoother and smoother up to a point. We don't know where that point is. But this is why depth really helps when it, in terms of generalization. So 
uh, there was how do you decide the size of the window? What is that uh, referring to? I'm not really sure. Okay. Uh, so, uh, no, no. why is maximum likelihood estimation the most used approach if it can limit the generalization of out of domain data for the same task? Uh, so, it just turns out that cross, it has something to do with the shape of the uh, shape of the. Uh, so, these are all strictly equivalent. If you're minimizing the cross entropy, you just ex you, you just end up performing maximum likelihood estimation. You could use any other loss function other besides the cross entropy. It just turns out that regardless of what loss function you use, eventually you end up performing some kind of maximum likelihood estimation. They're all uh, you know analogous to one another. The only thing that changes is the specific path of optimization. So uh, to that extent, you're stuck with the fact that when you're trying to maximize the fit to your training data, you end up with maximum likelihood estimation. Now you can impose other terms like regularizations and uh, other constraints, and these end up these are these these impose an inductive bias. These are like applying priors on your data on, on on your model, which pushes this from maximum likelihood estimation to maximum a posteriori estimation with specific priors. For example, if I'm trying to minimize the uh, L2 norm of the weights, this is like having Gaussian priors on my weights. If I'm minimizing the L1 norm, it's like having Laplacian priors on my weights. So the once you go away from just un unregularized learning, by definition, is going to be maximum likelihood. Regularized learning is going to be some form, form of, can be viewed as some form of NAP learning. But then the risk with MAP learning is always going to be whether the priors you impose, which is basically the regularization constraints, make sense or not. Did that answer the question at 3 p.m.? So Miguel, what do you mean by the size of the window? Uh, okay. What governs the directions followed by input in sync with the same direction? So I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, that's too old a question, right? Uh, tell you what, let me complete the last portion, then I can go back and answer the rest of my questions. Because the last bit of my talk will take a little, will, will not take very much time, about 20 minutes. Oh, so it was the window used to derive the sigmoid by averaging. The maximum likelihood estimate doesn't really explicitly consider a window, right? I'm just, all I was trying to say is, if you look at a neighborhood and plot it, you're going to get a sigmoid shape. Obviously, if you, you know, the definition of your neighborhood is, it, there's no explicit definition of the neighborhood because when you actually do the maximum likelihood estimation, you're ev eventually considering an infinitesimal the estimate of the percentage within an infinitesimal likelihood window. Okay, so here's a here is the uh, final bit. So it's more about, so how else can we view what the network learns? We've seen what the network learns at the output. We've seen what it does in terms of transforming the space. We've seen that the individual neurons actually are correlation filters, which learn specific features. But is there more to it? You know, what else can we say? So for that, let's go back to two hours ago. We saw that the basic positron is basically computing an inner product between its input and the weights. And it fires if this inner product exceeds a threshold. So in other words, the perceptron fires if the angle between the weights vector and the input is lesser than some 
theta. So if the weights vector, if the input is close enough to your weights vector at angle, it's going to fire output one, otherwise it's going to output a zero, right? Or something in between. So we saw that the weights vector for any perceptron is basically a template. It is, it, it represents the pattern that the perceptron is searching for in the inputs. So this is key. If a perceptron fires, if a perceptron whose weights, so let's say a perceptron is working on this uh, uh, five cross six grid of inputs, which are images. If its weights form this two shape, if the perceptron fires, then you can say with high confidence that the input also had roughly this two shape because the perceptron is a correlation filter. So when we, uh, there was another question about the features right earlier. So when we begin looking for, when we begin trying to uh, learn a network for some specific task, we expect the network to extract features relevant to the task. So if you want to look at it from a semantic perspective rather than the abstract, what happens in classification, what happens to the space point of view, then consider this little problem. Maybe you say you have this LED uh, grid and the network has to decide if the input is a digit or not. Then ideally, you'd expect the first layer neurons to capture the digit-like combinations of the inputs. So the, the, the patterns which explicitly indicate whether something is a digit or something is not part of a digit digit and the subsequent layers to perform Boolean logic of some kind on these feature detectors. So ideally, this layer captures features. So for example, this neuron might say, does the input have this horizontal bar on top? This one might say, does it have this vertical bar to the, or to the top right? This one might say, does it have a vertical bar to the, top, to the bottom right and so on. And so the, the uh, subsequent layers just operate on these features that the neurons have been that, that these neurons are detected. But then let me go back and say, suppose I do something very interesting. I'm going to use these neurons, I'm going to detect these features, and then I'm going to sort of I know what features these neurons are looking for. This neuron, for example, is looking for a horizontal bar on top, right? So let me let me recompose the patterns detected by these neurons when they detect them. So for instance, if I find that for some input only this guy and this guy have fired, then it means that the input has this bar and this bar and it has zeros everywhere else. So I can just reconstruct this input by putting together the weights patterns for these two neurons or alternately the weights patterns of all the neurons multiplied by their output. And that is going to reconstruct the input. So I can sort of reconstruct the input based on the features detected by the, by putting together the features detected by the individual neurons, weighted by whether the neuron actually, by the output of the neuron, right? So, if I could just recompose the detected features and it should recompose the input. It won't actually recompose the entire input. In this problem, the network is optimized to recognize digits. So the features it's going to retain are distinctly digit-like or obviously not digit-like features. Features, the rest are irrelevant and only lost. So uh, if you just recompose the input by putting together the patterns, the weight patterns, remember? of the neurons that fired, you're going to compose, recompose, have a partial reconstruction of the input, which makes it most explicit whether this was a digit or not. But suppose I want to make it explicit and I want to recompose the entire input. Then I can explicitly say, I want to, recomp I want to rearrange the patterns detected by these guys such that the, with the rearranged input is actually the entire 
you know, ready arranged, uh, the reconstructed output is actually the entire input. This is what we would call an autoencoder, and this is a neural network that is trying to predict the input itself. It has two parts, the encoder, which detects all the most significant patterns in the input, and the decoder recomposes the signal from these patterns. So how does this work? Let's consider the most simple autoencoder. This has just a single hidden unit. Now the hidden unit has a linear activation, so it doesn't have any non-linearity. Suppose I train this such that I train it to so, such that this output is as close as possible to the input. So in other words, the output of this linear unit is simply going to be w, w times x or w transpose x. I have some transposition errors here. And then I'm going to, the output of the neuron is wx. I'm going to reconstruct the input, which is basically the same as the weights of this neuron, weighted by the output of the neuron. So it's going to be w transpose wx, or actually w w transpose x again. Uh, transposition error in my slides, I should fix it. So the neuron is going to be trained to minimize this error, which is to say I'm minimizing the L2 error between the output, the, the reconstructed output and the input. And I estimate the weights to minimize this error. What weights will I get? Now, anybody who looks at this formula is going to be able to tell me immediately that this is just PCA. So in fact, if I have an autoencoder with just one linear neuron, what I will be performing is principal component analysis. The autoencoder is going to find the direction of maximum energy, or if the input is a zero mean random variable, it's going to find the direction of maximum variance. Now, the output is going to be, is, is only going to, uh, the output is going to be some linear scaling of W which means the output is always going to lie on a hyperplane. So what this does is that regardless of the input, it's going to map the input onto some point on this hyperplane, which is a linear scaling of W. And so if you try to find the W that minimizes the error between the output and the input, that is naturally just that this W is going to end up giving you the principal axis of your data and all input vectors are going to be mapped onto a point in this principal axis. And now if I just take the decoder, which is this portion of the network, and if I give it different inputs, because the network is only able to reconstruct linear scalings of this W, the output is always going to be on, along the principal axis or the major axis of the data. Now, so this is going to happen even if these two weights are different. If I have one set of weights going in and a different set of weights coming out, the reconstructed output is always going to be some scaling of U. So it's always going to be a hyperplane. And so uh, the, uh, this means that if I train this network to minimize the error between X hat and X, this U is always going to find me the principal axis of the data. Now, if I have more than one input, if I have a, if I have more than one hidden neuron, if I have many hidden neurons, then I'm going to have a network of this kind. And if all of these hidden neurons have linear activations, then once again, the output is going to be just some point on the linear subspace spanned by the weights, like weights matrix. So that the output is always going to be on some hyperplane in this space. And minimizing the squared error between x hat and x is still going to find me the weights which compose the principal subspace of the data. So this is still just going to give me principal component analysis. And output of the hidden layer is going to be a point in the principal subspace. The reconstructed data are always going to be in the principal subspace. So again, the terminology in this kind of structure, you have a portion which 
reconstructs the data and you have a portion of the network which com which which computes uh, so this this portion basically uh, reconstructs the data on some some subspace linear subspace the weights are the basis of the subspace the lower portion of the network is going to compute the point the the, the location of the input on this principal subspace and so the lower portion of the network, which computes the location is the encoder. The upper portion, which, re which places this point on the principal subspace is going to be called the decoder. So the encoder is the analysis net, which computes the hidden, hidden representation. And the decoder is a synthesis net, which recomposes the data from the hidden representation. So now, when this guy only has linear activations, uh, or rather when the decoder, which doesn't include this, only has, it's just a linear transform, then it can only reconstruct a linear hyperplane. And it's going to place all data on that linear hyperplane. So it's going to find the principal linear subspace. But then if the decoder has nonlinear uh, components to it, so if it's a, multi-layer network with many non-linear components to it, then the decoder is naturally going to warp the space. So what, the, what happens in that case is that the decoder is going to find the principal manifold, the principal curved manifold, which captures most of the data. And so now in this case, the encoder is going to be finding a position on this principal curved manifold and the decoder is going to be reconstructing the input as a position on this principal curve manifold. So when you have non-linearities, you're going to have non-linear principal component analysis. And so uh, if you have a non-linear, if you have non-linearities in the decoder, in order to appropriately correspondingly find the position in the space, you're also going to need non-linearities in the encoder. And these structure of the manifold that an autoencoder of this kind can capture is going is limited only by the the uh, size of the network and the activations used over here so when you have deeper decoders deeper networks they can capture more complicated manifolds now here is the interesting thing the decoder is always only going to reconstruct a point on the manifold, that's something, that, that's something that's important. So here, so here are some examples. In this case, I have two dimensional data. I had data which are, you know, have, which are scattered along a um, spiral with some noise. If I train an autoencoder with the structure of the autoencoder is given over here in the slides, and the Encoder brings it down to a single component and the decoder rescales the single component back to two-dimensional space. What we find is that the decoder ends up reconstructing the helix. And so any input is going to be placed, converted to a point on the helix. Uh, is going to be from power, is going to be converted to a coordinate on the helix, and the decoder is going to actually convert that back into the to a point in the cleaned up helix in the full dimensional space. That's because the decoder can only reconstruct the helix. There are limitations. So for example, over here, the training data only span the helix from here to here. And so there's a corresponding Z set of hidden Z values. And if you take the Z value outside this hidden range, then it's not going to continue constructing a helix. It's going to do something strange. Or here is another example. This one is, a sinusoid, we had data lying on a sinusoid with a small scatter. And when you train this network, you find that the decoder ends up reconstructing, capturing exactly the underlying sinusoidal manifold. So the encoder places this point somewhere on this manifold and the decoder reconstructs or finds the coordinate on the manifold. And then the decoder converts that coordinate to a position on this sinusoidal manifold. Again, the training data only spanned here to here. So there's a corresponding set of Z values uh, that you got for the training data. And now if you give it some Z value that's outside that training range, it's not going to continue convert, constructing sinusoids. It can do strange things. Uh, 
but then so uh, but then you know but then the point is this that when you have something of this kind and in particular when the uh, network reduces the dimensionality of the data before expanding it again you get what is called a bottleneck and this whole structure is an auto encoder that ends up performing non linear pca it learns the manifold for the data are properly trained now here's the nice bit the decoder of this auto encoder can only generate data on the manifold that the training data lies up, lie on so here for example within this range the decoder can only generate sinusoids there's nothing you can input the decoder that's going to make it produce a point you know higher than this or lower than this or something that's not on the sinusoid so the decoder can only generate data on the manifold that the training data lie on this also makes it an excellent generator of the distribution of the training data so if i any value that i input to the decoder is going to produce something on the training data manifold which will be similar to the training data so for example uh, if i were to train my auto encoder with my digits example the decoder of this auto encoder is only going to be able to produce things that look like digits or here is an audio example here we trained the uh, auto encoder on a uh, collection spectrograms from a collection of saxophone recordings and now when we excite the decoder with different values of these inputs it produces a spectrogram and here's what they sound like it's not producing random noise this decoder is only able to produce saxophone like sounds here's another example this one was trained on a clarinet this decoder is only able to produce clarinet like sounds so in general when you train an auto encoder of this kind the decoder and if it's trained properly the decoder is only going to be able to uh produce uh data which are kind of typical of the source that it was of of the data it was trained from and as as a closing i like to show a cute little example of how this works out how we can apply these two different things i'm going to use this for signal separation i'm given a mixed sound from multiple sources and i want to separate out the sources so the basic idea we're using is dictionary based techniques and dictionary based techniques here's what you do we learn a dictionary of building blocks for each sound source and all signal uh, such that all signals by the source are composed from the entries of the dictionary for the source for instance the dictionary of uh, building blocks for guitar i'm going to be guitar notes every sound produced by the guitar is going to be some combination of those notes so uh, except instead of feeding this manually you'd be learning this dictionary from data so if i were trying to separate mixed sounds i'd learn a dictionary for all the sources expected in the signal for example i could learn a dictionary for the drums i could learn a dictionary for the for the guitar and then finally when i get a mixed recording of drums and guitar the question i'll ask myself is what combinations of building blocks from the guitar dictionary and the drums dictionary do i have to combine to construct this mixed signal once i find the optimal set of building blocks from these two sets then i can just play out the contribution of the building blocks from this set to reconstruct the guitar the combination of building blocks from this dictionary to to reconstruct the drums the drums and i have separated sounds so i can recompose the separated signals that's what we're going to use here i'm going to use auto encoders as my dictionaries so i'm going to train an auto encoder for each of the sound sources in the mixed recording so for example if i've got guitar and drums i get a collection of guitar recordings i train an auto encoder for guitar i train another auto encoder for drums and then subsequently i know that the decoder of the guitar can only produce guitar like sounds the decoder of the drums can only produce the drum like sounds and now when i get a mixed recording of guitar and drums i'm going to say i'll take the decoders and i'm going to say 
how do I excite the guitar dictionary and the drum dictionary so that when I combine, when I add their outputs, the resulting sound is this mixed recording that I'm listening. And this I can do through back propagation. I have the entire network, but now I'm going to use the back, use back propagation to estimate the inputs to these dictionaries to best approximate this mixed sound. And then subsequently, once I've learned the inputs, the portion, the, 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 uh, the uh, output of the individual dictionaries before summation is going to give me the separated sounds. So let's see how that works. In this case, we actually use two wind instruments. It's actually got two instruments, one of which you may not even be able to hear clearly. So then we learn the dictionaries for each of the two sources and then use this simple, the auto encoder dictionaries for each of the two sources and then use them to separate the sounds. And here is the first source if I can play it. This is the original. And this is the second one. And so you can see basically uh, uh, what this tells us is that the autoencoder dictionaries have learned to capture the structure, the, the, the manifold for each of these two sources so perfectly that they're only able to generate or almost only able to generate data from those sources. And so when I use that to try to see how they could be excited to combine a mixed signal, they're doing almost like a job of separating the two. So just closing. So here's the story for the day. Classification networks, the final bit, they can be, they learn to predict the a posteriori probabilities of classes. The network under the final layer is a feature extractor that converts input data to be almost linearly separable. And the final layer is a classifier or predictor that operates on linearly separable data. Also, neural networks can be used to perform. The intermediate layers are feature detectors, which learn, which do two things. They A, learn the data manifold, and B, as the, uh, they sort of straighten the data manifold as you go through the, the through the network. And so this naturally follows to this second point, which is that neural networks can be used to perform linear or non-linear PCA using autoencoders which could be used to compose constructive dictionary for data, which in turn can be used to model data distributions. So I'll stop right here and I'll take questions. Any questions? So, I'm guessing so far, that, so far there are only those that were still there, in the Q and A. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, I think we got most of those two, right? Is there anything left I missed? There was one. Um, it, I, I think this one you you wanted to leave until after the lecture maybe, given the idea of feature detector, te detectors as templates, RNNs. Correct, then... so, so when you're given the idea of feature detectors as templates, are they supposed to just learn a lot of templates? Is this the reason for overfitting when too much capacity is given? So it's not about, uh, so in principle, uh, uh, now the, uh, the uh, answer to this has gone back and forth over the day, over the years. 
But the fact of the matter is, yes, ideally you want to learn as many features as possible, but not any odd feature. You want to learn features that are relevant to your problem, right? Because there are gonna be features which don't, I mean, uh, if I'm asked to distinguish between uh, different kinds of say flowers, which are all yellow, the fact that the color, that their color is yellow is irrelevant. It's not a feature you really want to learn. But then, so uh, it is important to capture as many features as possible for the input in order to be able to perform good classification. So you're essentially learning a lot of templates. It's, it, neural networks are literally just learning by memory, by rote in this case. Uh, and uh, the uh, more features you learn, the more capable you are to perform the classification. But then once again, this, your, this, the second part of your answer is also correct. When you have too much capacity, you end up learning irrelevant features which are really good to separate out the classes that you're specifically learning, um, specifically the data that you specifically, specifically got in training. And so uh, uh, that is why we like to impose some constraints on the kinds of features that we can take through, through. We can learn through regularization and such like, or the degree of uh, relaxation, you know, how much can the angle be? If you, if you impose, uh, if you really, really let the, let the network learn, in the limit, if your network has sufficient capacity, it's going to memorize your training data, which means it's going to only fire when the features in your training data match exactly, right? That means your angle is zero. So one way of generalizing is to say, I'm going to tolerate a greater angle between the input and the, uh, and, and, and the target, the weights. So these are these additional restrictions basically sort of try to uh, restrict the, the overfitting by giving you greater, um, how shall I say, relaxation with respect to the features that have, the templates that have actually been learned. So, there was another question. Was it another Francisco? Um, yeah, uh, so there are two uh, questions about this last part. So in these music examples, which is the advantage when compared to ICA, for example? ICA is, <laughs> it's a different problem, right? ICA, you have two, the way you said it, you have two microphones, two signals. I don't have two microphones over here. These are single channel recordings. These are dictionary based reconstructions. You could use ICA to get dictionary bases again, but then those are linear processes. You're only going to learn linear manifolds. Our claim here is that when you get complicated data of this kind like music, the manifold that the data lie on are not linear. And that's not something that, uh, you know, PCA or ICA or factor analysis is gonna capture. So when you do variational order encoders, for instance, PAEs are basically statistical extensions of AEs and their magic lies in the fact that they can capture these non-linear manifolds. So uh, what do I use as input if I use only the decoder part of the AE? So here we're estimating the input in this case. I've got the decoder for both the sources and so the decoder is basically going to be able to reconstruct an entire manifold, right? So the input is a position on the manifold. So we are using back propagation to learn I1 and I2, which are positions on the manifolds for the two sources represented by the two decoders. That is what is now, you know, reconstructed into actual uh, high dimensional features, which are combined to produce the next signal. Did that answer your question? There was, there was and Okay. Was there any other question? I'm assuming not, we're done, right? Well, uh, 
But there was also another one that uh, for a given problem, is there any way to predict which is the optimal configuration for the neural network? Impossible, quite impossible, simply because you don't actually have the function. If I were given a function, I might even be able to guess for a given function, for a given uh, uh, you know, activation function. If, if I'm given the target function and I'm given the activation function, it would be a combinatorial optimization problem, but I might be able to solve it. We are only seeing training data. The training data are samples from the function. So the situation we are lying in, living in is this, Let me go back here. We're living here, right? You're not actually given the entire function. You're just given these dots. So if I were given the complete specification of this, this grid, yes, I may be able to get, get some guesstimates on how to configure my model. If I'm only given these guys, I have no way of knowing whether the red line is indeed the true curve or should I be estimating, should I be learning the blue curve? There's nothing informing me, informing me about that. I'm beginning to take guesses. Once you're into the domain of guesses, you know, it's still a guess. It's entirely likely that the red curve is really what you should have been learning. We're just guessing that it's not. Is there anything else? Yeah, one more. Uh, when training a single layer MLP with many neurons to fit in the nonlinear decision boundaries from the examples, would it converge to the many cylinders approach? So the ones so, that you were talking about. Yeah, so again, it, it is, uh, remember the many cylinders approach only works if you have a very, 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 very large number of neurons. And in that case, that's pretty much what it's going to end up approaching. But more generally, you're going to have a finite number of neurons. And so it's kind of it's going to try to shape your function through the layers in some manner, in a more abstract manner. It will not be taking the many cylinders of much. Okay, I think we've covered everything there. Yeah? I think there's one last question. Uh -huh. So if we are dealing with nonlinear dimensions, why not using non-Euclidean functions in some neural networks where we use hidden representations to compute losses and distances? So they're, are they not equivalent in some sense? Okay. I mean, uh, the, uh, eventually, we are not actually using Euclidean distances or you could, you could be using any odd losses. Right? I mean, you can define your things, you can define, you can work off any Riemannian manifold, you can, you can be working off different spaces. It's, you know, when you, when you step back enough, at some level you're doing the same thing. It's not the Euclidean nature of the space or the uh, model that, uh, that, that, that is key over here. Within whatever, consistent math you're working with, everything that we've said will still hold. Okay. I think, I don't know if Ramon is there, but uh, I think it's... Uh... I am I am here, yes. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm in two meetings at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, guys, thank you very much. I think I'm done. Really appreciate the chance. And Francesco, we've got to catch up now that I'm back, right? Or almost. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the great talk. Big sir. Thank you very much. I don't know if any of you noticed, I changed my glasses halfway through my lecture. <laughs> I noticed because you said so, <laughs> that you were going to do it. Yes. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. See you next year.